I'm Elizabeth Ray. I'm Alistair Stevens. And Tom Cruise is Steve Randall in The Outsiders. I am so happy to be talking about this story with you. (laughs) I've waited a very long time, I feel like, to talk about The Outsiders with you because I know that I read it again, what, maybe like two or three years ago, maybe even during the pandemic. I remember reading it out on the balcony for the first time in years and years. The first time maybe as like a true adult to the point that now these boys are closer to being like my kids than being like my peers and just sobbing and just being struck again by how important and gorgeous the story is. And I hadn't seen the movie in maybe, God, another like 10, 15 years. And I always disliked it. I'd only seen it a couple of times. And I was ready to to now, after film school, be like, okay, I'm going to get it. (laughs) This is Coppola. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Uh, And and I feel like you can see where I'm going with this. But did you like the movie, Alistair? I didn't like the movie that much but even that comes with a giant asterisk i feel like because it's interesting one of the podcasts that we were talking about before we settled on the last star in hollywood yes was a podcast about the art of adaptation we are both independently fascinated by the process of adapting and recreating stories in different media and this is such an interesting example because this film has a tremendous number of very high points. There are mm-hmm. a lot of things to absolutely love about this film. It doesn't completely hang together, but the underlying text is so good that the film is elevated by it nonetheless. I'm it's so glad that you felt that way. fascinating exercise. As, as a critic who's trying to understand these texts and how they work, this one is unlike anything I think I've ever seen. It's so wow. weird as an adaptation. The closest thing to this is maybe the first and second Harry Potter films. Yes, sure, sure. Which are, taken on their own terms, kind of bad films, but the underlying material is so engaging and so magical Mm. that they work despite themselves, they work against themselves. I don't think there's that same internal antipathy in Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders as there is in Christopher Columbus's (laughs) Sorcerer's Stone or Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison because... You you and I kind of disagree about the first Harry Potter movie. The second one, I completely am with you. I don't think it's any good. But the first one, I do remember it passing the bar for me for what makes a good adaptation because watching it felt like reading it. That's really important to me. And it's such a difficult thing to pin down or to put any kind of like critical science to because it's hard to understand why something just touches you in an emotional way across these different uh, forms of media. Of course. I do not feel that that watching The Outsiders feels at all like reading The Outsiders. But I do think that watching the first Harry Potter movie felt a little bit like the first time I read a Harry Potter book. I think that's fair. And I think that's reflective of our approaches to these texts, mm-hmm. that you are something of an experientialist. There's an yes, emotional immediacy even. for yes. you. And I am much more of a formalist. I am much more yes. of, a, of a technical reader. And I would even hesitate to say that the first Harry Potter film is not good. It's not good by some metrics. It's not good sure. from some perspectives. But obviously for you, it works. And therefore, it is defensibly good, I think. Mm-hmm. My experience of The Outsiders is in many ways the polar opposite of yours. I did I not that. grow up in Oklahoma. I did not grow up in the United States. I had not read The Outsiders. I had not seen The Outsiders. Within the last 24 hours, as of this recording, I have watched two different versions of this movie and read the book. Amazing. So I am steeped in it. I am immersed in it right I now. I feel and so it loved. <laughs> is absolutely magical. Yes. I wonder what this book does to the young mind, what this book does to the young reader in high school, in middle school. In middle school is where it's apparently usually uh, required reading. Yeah. yeah. I have long been a critic of the kinds of books that are set for high school students and set for middle school mm-hmm. students. You know, you can't read Catcher in the Rye at the age of 14 and understand anything about anything yes. because at 14, you don't understand anything about anything. <laughs> These types of books, the, the great works of the literary canon, are not oftentimes intended for teens. Right. The Outsiders absolutely is, yes. while also maintaining a complete transparency to the adult reader, a real yes. interesting reflexivity for the adult reader, too. It is an absolutely knockout book. We're going to talk about The Outsiders in great detail as we move forward mm-hmm. through this episode. But I want to begin by talking about Tom Cruise. The reason for the season, the reason that we are all here, 
<laughs> Tom Cruise. This is the third Tom Cruise movie. This is the third Tom Cruise literary adaptation. And I thought, that's unusual. It's, it's rare to find an actor who works so consistently in just literary adaptations, particularly in the early stages of their career. So I went through and took a look at the rest of his career. How many of Tom Cruise's 48 listed roles on IMDb would you say are literary adaptations of one form or another? I feel like the more I've been looking into adaptation and the more I've been interested in it, the more I see how many things are adapted. It feels like a <laughs> lot to me. That's fair. So I'm going to guess, if you're saying it's a big number, that it's going to be like half of what he did, like like 22? Not quite half, but just over 30%. Yeah, almost a third of his yeah. roles, 15 out of the 48 roles, which is actually, despite what we might feel about the preponderance of literary adaptation in the movie theaters these days, is actually much higher than the average, particularly for the 80s and the 90s. We can run through. Do you want to run through his list very quickly? Sure, yeah. So Endless Love is adapted from the 79 Scott Spencer novel. Taps is adapted from the 79 Devery Freeman novel Father Sky. The Outsiders, of course, from the 1967 S.E. Hinton novel. The Color of Money is adapted from the 1984 Walter Tevis novel. Cocktail adapted from the 1984 Haywood Gould novel. Born on the 4th of July from the 1976 autobiography of Ron Kovich. The Firm, of course, an adaptation of the Grisham novel from 1991. Interview with a Vampire, the 1976 mm -hmm. Anne Rice novel. Eyes Wide Shut is based on a 1924 novella, Rhapsody, a dream novel by Arthur Schnitzler. Because, of course, wow. all of Kubrick's films past the first two are adaptations of source yeah. material. It's one of those things that makes Kubrick such an interesting director to study. Minority Report is adapted from the 1956 Philip K. Dick novella. War of the Worlds, of course, the 1897 H.G. Wells novel. Jack Reacher, the first Tom Cruise Jack Reacher film, is adapted from the 2005 Lee Child novel Last Shot, which is, for those of you keeping track at home, the ninth Jack Reacher book. He then does Edge of Tomorrow, which is adapted from the 2004 Japanese light novel All You Need Is Kill. The second Jack Reacher movie, Never Go Back, is adapted from the 2013 Lee Child novel, Never Go Back, which is the 18th Jack Reacher God. novel. <laughs> and then, finally, The Mummy, which is kind of an adaptation of the first mummy story in the English language, which is, do you know this? Do you know the history of mummy fiction? This is so fascinating. This is just a couple of years after Frankenstein. This is 1827. It is a three-volume novel called The Mummy! Exclamation point, a tale of the 22nd century by the 20-year-old English science fiction wow. pioneer, Jane Webb. Wow. So it's okay. mummies and science fiction all in 1827. It's not good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> oh, no. It has not aged at all <laughs> yeah. well. It is, it is fascinating, though. It's a very interesting uh, text. So that's 15 out of the 48. And might indicate something to us as we're beginning to move the needle on our understanding of Tom Cruise as an icon here in his third film. This propensity toward literary adaptation might be one of the things that makes Tom Cruise so unique as we move forward. It is just a literate adult kind of filmography. He doesn't mm -hmm. make films for kids, which I think distinguishes him. Oh, interesting. From, it, it absolutely connects him to, you know, the stars of the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. but it distinguishes him from your Will Smiths, your Dwayne Johnsons, your sure. other actors who kind of occupy that space. That is interesting. Yeah. I should note, too, that many of his other works are also adaptations. Uh, Top Gun is inspired by an article in a magazine. Days of Thunder is loosely wow. based on a couple of real-life NASCAR drivers. A Few Good Men, of course, an adaptation, but of not literary, yes. the adaptation of Aaron Sorkin's play. All the Mission Impossible movies, adaptations of the oh, 1966 of TV show. In name only, really. Vanilla Sky is a remake of a Spanish language movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Rock of Ages is based on the 2005 musical. Oblivion, his sci-fi film from the yes. 21st century, is said to be adapted from a comic. If you look online, you will often find references to it being adapted from a comic. It is not. The director, Joseph Kaczynski, started making a comic as a part of the pre-production oh. process, as part of his previs. But then stopped making it, so it doesn't actually yeah. exist. <laughs> and lastly, uh, American Made is inspired by the real life of pilot and CIA informant Barry Seal. We'll get to that in about nine months, I guess. <laughs> it's a long way to go before we get to that. So with the stage properly set, 
I guess it's time for the trailer game. <gasps> oh my God, that's right. It's your turn. Do you want to tell people at home about the trailer game? Uh, the trailer game is exactly what it sounds like. We have to improvise a trailer. <laughs> In what sense is that exactly what it sounds well, like? Well, <laughs> okay, I guess. I, I guess the game is that uh, we take turns improvising a trailer for the film that we are going to talk about just to give a little bit of an idea to anybody who might not have seen the movie before about what we're getting into. Although if you haven't seen or read The Outsiders... Please do. It's so lovely and important, especially to read. It took, what, it was four hours for me to read it. Granted, yeah. I'd read it a lot before, so I, I could really speed through it. And you, The your audiobook audio book is five hours. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's worth it. I think that we would possibly support the skipping of Endless Love and the skipping of Taps. Yes. But, but this one? Yes. This one, make an mm-hmm. exception. Next week, you can also take off. Honestly, it'll be fine. You don't need to watch losing it. <laughs> totally true. But yes. this week, do your reading. Do your homework. Yeah. It'll be worth it. I promise. Yeah. Okay. In a golden haze of technicolor saturation and Oklahoma dust, one young man must give his life purpose while bounded by poverty, by violence, and by inescapably the works of Robert Frost. Can young Ponyboy Curtis make sense of the divisions in his life and landscape? Can he figure out the accents that belong to his brothers? <laughs> in May 1984, don't miss Francis Ford Coppola's S.E. Hinton's Ponyboy Curtis's long-form 10th grade English paper, What I Did in My Summer Holidays. <laughs> that anything that's good thank you that's good is it 84 i thought it was 83 did i say 84 you did say 84 fire yeah. that trailer guy <laughs> it is 83 of course i thought it, it was 83. 83 the only reason i know is because i was born in 84 and so i tend to know like the benchmark <laughs> movies from my birth year and i was like was outside was outsiders there the whole time ah oh, i managed to keep so many things in my head during that that's okay one you of them was perfect. not the release year for this film <laughs> i'm very sorry that's okay we are going to force a somewhat more rigid structure on this episode of the podcast than we normally do because it is going to be very tempting with each twist and turn of this film to talk instead about the book. Yeah. So Elizabeth, I'm going to corral a little space here where we can just talk about the book (laughs) and then the book is off limits for the rest of the podcast. Oh, okay. This is how it must be. So let me prompt you by saying this is an Oklahoma classic. Absolutely. It is, of course, a pillar in the American canon as a whole. I think that's true. It's often credited with inventing YA fiction, which is extraordinary and and wild, possibly dubious, but it doesn't matter whether or not it did. What matters is that it is a foundational text nonetheless. Absolutely. Tell me about your personal experience of S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders. I, I can't remember exactly the first time I read it, but it was not assigned to me in school the first time I read it. I got to read it in school already loving it and being nervous about talking about it in school, in fact, because I loved it so much. I think it might have been one that my sister read first, but I don't remember. Elaine and I were both obsessed with this book. Uh, We had a really terrible paperback copy. The cover art on the front looked like New Kids on the Block or something. So (laughs) we tore the cover off because it felt like a very serious book to us, and we disliked it looking just so cheesy on the outside. I will try and track down that cover. You can help me track down that cover, and (laughs) we'll put it in the show notes for this episode. Yeah. Uh, But we passed it back and forth a lot. We highlighted and underlined a lot. We had it memorized. I memorized the Robert Frost poem, of course. By that time, I had already had lots of poems memorized because poetry was something that was really important to me from like fifth grade, I think, maybe even earlier than that. But it was just one of those books that made me feel very seen and understood. Uh, Even though I did not come from such a rough and tumble upbringing as Pony Boy, I was, you know, working class Oklahoma kid who felt very aware in a way that I think probably every young kid does around that age, especially around 13, of, of just seeing the world a little bit differently in a way that I think is really common for artists and poets of just feeling on the outside and feeling like you're really looking in. Sure. And Pony Boy's voice especially is so extraordinary. I I think the character, the, the way when you're reading the book, you watch him not only figuring out the world and his place in it, but really doing the work to understand uh, every other person around him the extraordinary empathy 
of Essie Hinton is something I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen in another author and certainly not an author so young. When you think that she was 15 when she started this book, 16 when she finished it. Mm-hmm. And 18 by the time it's published. Is insane. It is. And she feels the same way. I love when she talks about the book and feels like, is it okay if I read a little bit from the forward? Because I, I want- Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I just, I, I, I love this. She, she talks about how she was always a writer. Um, she talks about getting letters all the time. And she says, the letters saying, I loved the book are good. The ones that say, I never liked to read before and now I read all the time are better. But the ones that say, the outsiders changed my life. And I read it 15 years ago and I realized how much it has influenced my life choices. Frankly, scare me. Who am I to change anyone's life? I guess the reply is, it's the book, not the author. And it's the message, not the messenger. A lot of the time I feel that The Outsiders was meant to be written, and I was chosen to write it. It's certainly done more good than anything I could accomplish on a personal level. If this sounds like I'm overwhelmed by the decades of incredible response to what began as a short story I started when I was 15 years old, well, I guess that's the truth. Stay gold. S.E. Hinton. Remarkable. So modest and humble. And I think that's the thing that I love about Ponyboy, too, is that he's such a humble YA protagonist compared to so many of the YA protagonists that we see. Yes. And not a false humility, not a, oh, I wish my arms weren't so lanky kind of humility, but like a real, I'm just trying to figure out the world kind of modesty. Yeah. It's certainly one of the things that distinguishes the outsiders from modern YA fiction is that it is not conforming to that same a heroic superstructure. This is not Absolutely. the story of a hero. Not in the least. This is the story of, if anything, mm. A survivor. Yeah. Someone who endures and flourishes despite rather than overcoming. If you can even call it flourishing, I mean, just persists, I think, is enough. Certainly by the end of the novel. Yes. I think we all have our own headcanon about what happens to Pony Boy following the events of the novel. Well, and it's such a tragic book, but I find it so full of hope. Yeah. And reading it now, again, as an adult, I'm always struck by how hopeful it makes me because of Essie Hinton's extraordinary empathy, but also it always breaks my heart because how little things change, like how how much we still see infighting for no goddamn reason from kids through adults, from, you know, a playground level to a massive like geopolitical level. Right. How little things really do change. Social inequality, Absolutely. economic inequality, certainly. Mm-hmm. I do want to distinguish, though, it's easy, I think, to superimpose Essie Hinton on Ponyboy, this thoughtful, sensitive teen coming to terms with a fractured and divided world and with the beauty of art and the defiance of hope contained yeah. within that world still. I do want to disambiguate the two a little bit because it would be tempting to just assume that Ponyboy is Essie Hinton's voice with the pronouns changed. Sure. But she also writes so incredibly vividly in the voices of all of the other characters. Absolutely. All of these greasers are distinct, are vibrant. Cherry is a masterpiece on the page. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And again, just seeing somebody doing the work to understand both sides so much. So few books, I think, would be interested in finding a way to humanize Bob after his death. Like, let him Mm. just be the bully who got killed. And, and, And even to valorize Dally after his but we work so hard to find the humanity in every single person and to try to understand why they would have acted in such a way. Yes, imperfectly, I think. We, we don't completely sure. connect all of that together. And I will say, too, in the spirit of transparent criticism, that this is also a book that spends its last act in search of an ending. It is structurally sure. somewhat unformed. We really reach the climax of the story way before the book is over. Yeah, yeah, and that's fair. We're closing off threads almost as though Hinton is is searching through the story for that final elusive terminal period where mm. we go looking for it, and we go looking for it in the hospital with Johnny, and we go looking for it with with Soda Pop, and we go looking for it, you know, in the school, and we we try to track it down, and then ultimately, of course, we find it, and when we do, it is enormously satisfying. Oh, good. You did find the answer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. But we do end up, I think, with a, a little bit of, of wool, a little bit of, of stuffing yeah. there at the end of the book, which isn't honestly unwelcome, particularly because it is such a quick read. And I do wonder if 
it were pared down still further if some of that inessential material was was refined or focused mm. it might lose some of that magic it might lose some of the yeah. the authentic it seems to me spontaneity of the text yeah yeah i like how there are moments where you feel like she really is finding the characters even as she goes i love the interjection where pony boy and like the back third of the book is oh yeah i run track i forgot to mention that and he's yeah. like did you just find that out as he i wonder it doesn't matter Stephen king turn right there it is and it couldn't matter less like it does it works either way but no. i do find it amusing that's true there is an element of that finding the story as you go but also all of these characters show up so vividly in the first four yes. pages it's yes. remarkable how quickly they are there and how clearly they are defined yeah hinton said too when she was talking about it that uh, a lot of her friends assumed that the characters were based on them. And she's like, they they really weren't, though. Like, they they came yeah. to me full form. Like, of course, you always borrow. But nobody was like, oh, Dallas was this guy, so-and-so. Like, that's just not how it worked, which I think is great. We should say for the reader at home, for the listener at home, that S.E. Hinton, of course, grows up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The book mm -hmm. is set in Tulsa, although never named in the novel, which I found Yeah, that didn't surprising. even occur to me. But you pointed it out. And yeah, you're right. That's so odd. There is also some geographical trickery or, or alteration yes. made uh, in the book versus real life Tulsa. In the book, the conflict is between the East and West. In real Tulsa, the conflict is between North and South, as it is, interestingly, in the movie. Right. Yeah, where they are be, shooting real Tulsa. Yeah, yeah, which may be Coppola choosing to anchor it more directly in the real world. There's an interesting bit of speculation online that the reason Coppola changes it to North and South from East and West is to distinguish it from West Side Story. Oh. <laughs> Which is, I mean, interesting. Uh, of course, okay. But this that's film like is made, Jets and Sharks. I don't remember them even saying It has East West, and West in the title, though. Oh. I don't know. Obviously, okay, this is unfounded okay, internet sure, sure. speculation. Yeah, but all right. there it is. Before we move on into the movie, can we spend just a little more time so I can hear you tell me about reading it for the first time and about the things that you <laughs> liked? I've been waiting so long. The first thing that struck me was the immediacy of Pony Boy's voice. Yeah. That it is so clear on the page who this young man is of the immediate tension that he feels between what we might think of as his higher calling, his artistic calling, and the realities of his quotidian life, right? Mm -hmm. His loyalty to the greasers, his loyalty to his brothers, the complicated structure of his domestic life, the recent death of his parents. All of these things are just immediate. They are right there. Mm -hmm. And what we get is so nuanced and so thoughtful, but also, crucially, so light, so effortless yes. seeming. There isn't a line in this book that feels composed. There are lines in the film which come across as composed sure, because they are lacking the naturalism of, of Pony Boy's voice in aggregate. But though he is a careful and articulate young man, it doesn't feel as though he is performing for the reader. It feels very much as though in the way that a Holden Caulfield explicitly performs for the reader, right? The, the mm. Catcher in the Rye is such a piece of artifice. That's the purpose of Catcher in the Rye. That's not a criticism of that novel. Mm -hmm. That's a thing that it is, it is intentionally doing. We get none of that from Ponyboy Curtis. He is so natural, so fluid in his accounting, so generous in his accounting. Generous, yeah, I like and that. And this is underpinned in this, this glowing, lovely, thoughtful, sweet-natured Affectionate, yeah. yeah. It's a really genuinely remarkable book. I'm so glad you liked it. I'm so is, glad you read it. Me too. <laughs> I'm going to read it again, I promise. <laughs> who is your favorite character? Who's the most vivid character for you on the page? And we'll maybe distinguish this with who our favorite character in the movie is as we move forward. Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's hard not to love Soda Pop, of course, because sure. Pony loves him so much, yeah. I guess. But I've always had a real soft spot for Dairy. So that's, really? Yeah, that's the kind of character that I always like. I have a harder time connecting with Dairy. That's interesting. Well, so does Pony. So it doesn't surprise sure, me, sure, maybe. Yeah. But I don't know if it's an older sibling thing. I had a sibling that was older than me, but she even called me like her big little sister because I tended to be more responsible, I suppose. There was a time in my life, too, uh, when I was in high school, when I was doing a lot of the driving the kids to school, picking up the milk from the gas station, you know, taking care of things when my mom was having a real hard time and uh, and my dad was working a lot. And I think that's maybe part of... And I think that's maybe part of why I like dairy, but I also had a crush on dairy, which is like completely unrelated to my own 
you know, understanding him in that sort of way. So right, a, I don't a know. literary crush or a Swayze crush? Oh, a Swayze crush for goddamn oh, yeah. sure, but definitely a literary <laughs> I crush. Trust yeah, anyone who doesn't have a crush on Swayze in well, this. Well, the film. thing is, like when I came around to watching the film, I disliked it so completely that right. I couldn't even. I I never associated the actors with the people in the book. It was way too late for me by then. I do think that one of the benefits of coming to the story in the way that I have, which is to say that I watched the extended cut of the film, read the book, watched the theatrical cut of the film mm -hmm. in that order. I am, I think, warmer on the film than you are because yeah. that is my first experience. And you're always going to gravitate a little bit toward yep. your first experience. I think 2-Bit is my favorite character. Really? Pretty consistently. I think 2-Bit's great. And I think Emilio Estevez is great. That is great. Yeah, no, I love 2-Bit. 2-Bit's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, he's he's so necessary on the page. It's just like a social lubricant. I enjoy yeah, that about yeah. him a lot. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to cover in the book before we move on strictly and rigorously uh, to the films? I could... <laughs> I could talk about this book for hours and hours and hours. So no, I think I've got everything. I, I will just say right up front, the only places where I really did feel that the film let us down as an adaptation, um, besides the fact that you just cannot get that kind of interiority, you can't, like without doing voiceover the whole way through, is that I wish that when Pony Boy gets in the car with Randy, that he they had had that talk about Bob and about yes. pushing against his parents and trying to get a no and never getting one. We lose that in the film. And I, I think it's a net loss. I really do. I think so too. And kind of an unforgivable loss because this yeah. is a very faithful film. This is faithful to the point of slavish Yes, in its adaptation of S.E. Hinton's dialogue. And yet that, which would have been so easy to include. Yeah. You have the scene already. Cut. Yeah, it's odd. An odd choice. I, I completely agree. Yeah. It reminds me, to bring it back to Harry Potter, of uh, my favorite Harry Potter film and my favorite Harry Potter book are both the third or Prisoner of Azkaban. And I just find it completely unforgivable that they never mention that Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs wrote the Marauder's Map. I'm like, it would have taken you five seconds. <laughs> you do all this other weird doesn't stuff anyway. It like, <laughs> doesn't seem significant in any way. It just would... seems odd to me. Like, yeah. I don't know. Are we willing at this point to tease a possible future venture in the realm of the outsiders sure yeah we are unfortunately just too busy to do this right now otherwise i promise we will be starting it this week right but now, at some yeah. point when our schedules open up a little bit probably not until the new year i think we're going to do a book club read along something yeah. chapter by chapter That'd through be the wonderful. outsiders because there is so much depth there there is so much detail there it is such a wonderful read and it would take us 12 weeks if we did a chapter a week, which is still a relatively short engagement. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. If you would like to take part in that kind of thing, mm -hmm. head on over to patreon.com slash laststarpod and pledge your support. You can hang out with us over on the Discord, which is probably where it would take place. All of this is very unfounded. I'm making yes. promises live on air that I shouldn't be making. <laughs> it's not a promise. It's a maybe. It's a maybe. It's, it's a, a we would love to. <laughs> we would love to someday. Let's get into the movie then. And we must, of course, begin by talking about Francis Ford Coppola, one yeah. of the greats, one of the inarguably most influential, most successful directors of the 20th century. Do you have particularly post-film school strong feelings about Coppola? As a filmmaker, not necessarily. I haven't seen a whole lot of Coppola stuff. I saw the two Godfathers and podcasted about them previously with Daphne Olive. Um, but I don't think I've seen much other Coppola. Can you remind me? I know Apocalypse Now is a big one and I've never seen that one. But what are what are his big heavy hitters? I mean, The Godfather probably is the the outstanding right. contribution from him. He has this run from 72 to 79 where in 72 he does The Godfather. In 74, he releases the Gene Hackman film, The Conversation, and The Godfather Part Two, and is nominated for Best Picture for both. Wow. He wins for The Godfather pa uh, Part Two, But that is a rare double nomination in the same year. And then you're right, Apocalypse Now in 79. There's kind of a turning point, honestly, around The Outsiders. He kind of moves into smaller and, and less grandiose mm -hmm. films up until The Outsiders. He is very much replicating an older kind of filmmaking. That's a little compromised by Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. but Apocalypse Now, even in 79, feels like something, cinematically speaking, of a throwback. It feels yes. like an older kind of film. He comes from a very strong cinematic tradition. That kind of ebbs a little in his influence as he moves forward. His last big hit, I guess technically he has this like mid-90s run of, of inarguable hits, but movies which I think time has not been so kind to 
1990, he does The Godfather Part 3. In 1992, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And in 1996, Jack, followed up in 97 by The Rainmaker. Yes, Jack, the Robin Williams film. Yes. An odd choice for Francis Ford Coppola? Yes, very much. Okay. A film that is uncomfortable with its own tonality? Yes, very much much Bram Stoker's Dracula though Dracula, I'll have to rewatch that Dracula it's been is too strong, long but Dracula's also I think even consciously in his filmography a throwback to his earlier films yeah. to his earlier style well certainly I mean spoilers for later on but The Outsiders looks old it does not look like an 83 movie it, it looks does. like a 67 movie which I feel like is a choice it, it, I mean it's obviously a choice but I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't like it when I watched it when I was younger I, I think it just felt too old for a book that felt so present mm, to me absolutely and so timeless, I guess. And though we think of Coppola first as a director, as we should, mm-hmm. he was also a very skilled writer. He receives two nominations and one win for Best Original Screenplay at the Academy Awards and three nominations and two wins for Best Adapted Screenplay. Of course, of his own those work. are adaptations. No, no. Adaptations nope. of Mario Puzo's novels for The Godfather. <laughs> oh, right. Right. He, yeah. I forgot that those were adaptations. Also, to tie us back to last week's podcast, one of the films that he wins Best Original Screenplay for is is his co-writing credit on Patton, starring George C. Scott. Wow. A movie which won, I just looked this up, which won in 1971, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Original Screenplay, Best Editing, and Best Sound. Damn. Wow. That's that's a heavy hitter. That is. I've never seen that one. Have you? No, no. (laughs) (laughs) Ironically. (laughs) Well, in any case, I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, Coppola's filmography, but... He does have a special place in my heart because of The Outsiders Mm -hmm. and because of the work that he's done for film in Oklahoma. Of course, Scorsese just shot Killers of the Flower Moon here, and there's so much buzz about that already being released any moment now uh, as of the time that this podcast comes out. And he and Coppola are both putting a lot of money into OCCC, the Oklahoma City Community College uh, film program, which is all making film very hands-on, but it's got so much money. And the two of them came and gave a lecture while I was at school. I missed it. I heard about it after the fact. And I, of course, didn't go to OCCC. I went to OU, which has a much smaller and like less vocational program. Sure. It's less yeah. technical, um, more more study and theory done. Although I did make my own short film when I was at OU. So that's We're going exciting. to have an opportunity to talk about your filmmaking career as we move through our beat by beat breakdown. Oh, yeah. Of this yeah. film, in fact, uh, weirdly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Of the complete novel version anyway. So... But yes, all that to say, uh, Coppola has a special place in my heart, but I don't really know his films that well. Coppola famously gets involved with The Outsiders after receiving a petition from a school librarian in Fresno, California, Joe Ellen Misakian, who writes to Coppola on behalf of her 7th and 8th grade students who want The Outsiders adapted by someone, Mm -hmm. and they pick him. (laughs) <laughs> this is this is the quote from the letter. Quote, we are all so impressed with the book, The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton, that a petition has been circulated asking that it be made into a movie. We have chosen you to send it to. Aww. 15 pages of children's signatures were attached to the letter written in different colors. And Coppola was so inspired that he picked up yeah. the book, loved it, and adapted it. I have to say, I don't think I would have the guts to try to adapt this book. I, I don't think it's adaptable. Not this really. This is almost spoiling our conclusion on the film, I think. But yes, adapting intimate first-person narrative. That is kind of the thing that novels are for and kind of very markedly not the thing that movies are for. Right. Movies are for externalization and objectivity yeah. because the role of the camera in the scene is necessarily going to be is going to be objective. Objective, yeah. It's not to say that it can't be done, but it is difficult and it is done well very rarely particularly if you were going to resist the lure of the adapter's crutch voiceover. Voiceover. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's tempting to imagine a version of this story Mm. that is accompanied by Ponyboy's voiceover, either in the moment, either a literal voiceover overlaying the action or a framing device where we see him writing or we see him Which we only do years once. later. You know, we come back to him when he's 45 years old and he's giving a book tour about that oh, thing God. that he wrote one time, you know, and he's talking <laughs> yeah. about it in a, in a way that is disjointed in time and place. Mm. These are the tricks that we use to allow for additional interiority. It's not easy. And even then, you don't need to use those tricks. There are incredibly intimate incredibly internal films it's just not easy it's not no that i think is going to be the root of our criticism of this film ultimately and ultimately why we prefer the book but 
again, as we said at the beginning, the core material is such, and so much of the incidental filmmaking is such, that I think this still comes out as a pretty good film. This still comes out as a, as a B plus. Tell me about which one you're talking about. Are you talking about the complete novel, well, which was 2005? Yeah, let's, let's break right that down. Now. Yeah. The film was shot on location in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Filming took place from March 29th to May 15th, 1982. So that's about a year's worth of edit and post-production before we get it out into cinemas. So the original cut of the film that Coppola delivers to Warner Brothers runs 133 minutes. And the studio feels, perhaps wisely, that that is too long. Mm. So they cut it all the way down to the bone. They perhaps go too far the other way and cut it down to 91 minutes. That is the theatrical version that is released in 1983 and is the only version that is available until 2005. So that was the version that you saw? Yes, that's that's the version I saw up until recording this podcast when I yeah. first saw the, the newer version, yes. The theatrical version is cut to ribbons. It yeah. loses... Much of the beginning of the book, it loses a lot of the end of the book and a few interstitial things between. It makes the story just much less substantial. Yeah, it's so thin on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, I can see why I didn't like it then. I still don't like it very much now. I, I guess if if pushed, I even <laughs> despite the egregious soundtrack, I think I prefer the complete yes. novel. Let's talk about the 2005 complete novel version. Coppola yes. comes back in 2005 to remaster the film, to re-edit the film, and to give it an entirely new soundtrack because the 83 theatrical version is scored by Carmine Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola's father. And it is a very old-fashioned sweeping strings, it 1960s is. Technicolor epic kind of score. And Which, Francis Ford Coppola did not like it. Yeah. And in a very outsidersy kind of move, did not want to confront his dad about it. <laughs> so he just left it in the film. Yeah. Unfortunately, Carmine Coppola dies in 1991. So by the time, more than a decade later, that Francis Ford Coppola can go back to the film, he's ready to strip it out and replace it with, oh, let me check my notes here, 1,000 songs. <laughs> Many of them Elvis Presley. It's a lot. It's so much. It's a lot. And I, I, think, I really think you and I differ here. Okay. The original score is is very old fashioned, very yeah. throwback. It does not bother me hardly at all. Yeah, I think it's the fine. The needle drops in the 2005 complete novel version are so frequent and intrusive. They are. They are. It was intrusive driving is a good me word. crazy by the time we got halfway through that film. Yeah. And I wrote down too in my notes that there were times where it was just absolutely incongruous to the point that it felt weird. Like, and we know how hard it is to score a film from things that you're trying to find rather than things that were like made for it. It is, I think, a little easier for Francis Ford Coppola than you know, it that's is a for good point, us darling. using Adobe stock music. That's but a yes. good point. That's a good point. But it just reminded me of that, of like when we were working on the, the the edit for the short film that we made and we're dropping in different music behind things be like god that's not it you know yeah but he just kept the god that's not it but it's a placeholder like for me all of the like um rock guitar i don't even know what it is like a lot of a lot of twangy steel guitar yeah yeah, yeah. just really it reminded me of like tarantino when there's suddenly this much less intentional and much, much, much less cool, infinitely less cool. Yeah. There's almost nothing cool about the soundtrack for the 2005 version. It, I mean, if we're going with cool, I think it's cooler than the 83 version, just because you're right. There, I, I think I said it reminded me of like Little House on the Prairie. Like it's that yeah. kind of... Old-fashioned strings, which we decided was contemporaneous, I suppose, more or less. Some, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Little House is, I think, 74. It starts, but it's running through to 83, certainly. Yes, uh, yes. And I think that maybe those strings, one of the reasons that they don't bother me is that the cinematography, as we mentioned before, is also so traditional. So throwback, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the 2005 version, the complete novel edition, which is the the version that you are more likely to get now if you watch The Outsiders. Which is so interesting to me. Adds yeah. in all of that material from the beginning, adds in all of that material from the end. It excises a couple of very brief scenes in the middle, but it is generally just more. Yeah. I like it as a narrative construction much more than I like the theatrical cut. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would definitely agree. There's just more there. There's more to chew on. It's more of a full story. Uh, you get so much more Rob Lowe. So much more soda pop. Get, oh, yeah. Ten times more Rob Lowe, <laughs> ten times more Patrick Swayze. It's striking how little yes. they are in that 
original cut. This is a great opportunity to talk, in fact, about the amazing cast. Wild. Of this one. This yeah. is outstanding. I mean, obviously, we're talking about a lot of first performances, a lot of up-and-coming new actors as we look here at the beginning of Tom Cruise's filmography. But good Lord, this cast is yeah. just amazing. So stacked. Let's do them in age order, shall we? We Ooh, start okay. with, let's start with Ponyboy. See Thomas Howell is 17 when he makes this film. Mm -hmm. Diane Lane is 18. Matt Dillon and Rob Lowe are both 19. Wow. Emilio Estevez, who is so good in this film, and Tom Cruise are both 21. Ralph Macchio, believe it or not, is 22 years old. No! Playing 14 in this that film and doing so wild. completely convincingly. He absolutely looks like the youngest one. To look at them in this film and believe that Ralph Macchio is three years older than Matt Dillon feels impossible. That seems and impossible. Yeah. Of course, Swayze's over there being 31. That is that is weird. Like, I love Patrick Swayze and I love him as Derry, but he is too old. He yeah. is probably Canonically, too old. Daryl Curtis. Particularly as part of the plot is the fact that he could not get custody of his younger brothers after the death of their parents. Well, well, he's he's got it, but like they're keeping an eye on him and they're keeping an eye on the family and sure, like the, sure. you know, Department of Human but Services comes and checks on them. Yeah. yeah, because canonically in the book, he is 20. So I have a fun little game for us as we're moving forward. Ooh, okay. I would like you to guess which of these actors has the most credits at this point in their career and which of these actors has the least credits at this point in their career. C. Ooh. Thomas Howell, Diane Lane, Matt Dillon, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, Tom Cruise, Ralph Macchio, Patrick Swayze. Here, I'll give you one for free. This is Tom Cruise's third film credit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Uh, that's a good question. I'm like, you think oldest would be Swayze and therefore, but I don't think that's true. I feel like this is about when he was getting going. I'm going to say this is terrible, but I'm going to say Emilio Estevez has the most because he's a Nepo baby. No, that's interesting. Emilio Estevez has four film credits, though, actually, really? only three aired, as it were, because he was cut entirely out of Apocalypse Now. He shot for Apocalypse Now, wow. starring, of course, his father. Yeah. Uh, and then was cut out of it. So, so he had okay. the experience of shooting it, but it wasn't a released film. So this is his fifth film. Okay. Um... That puts him third on the list. There are two more actors who have more wow. credits than Emilio And Estevez. how old did you say Matt Dillon was when he did Matt this? Matt Dillon was 19 when he shot this. Do you think he has uh, more or uh, more or less? I don't know. He did some Brat Pack stuff, but I don't know when All that of was. That That's late, right? Yes. That's like 88? Okay. Yeah. Ooh, Ralph Macchio. Ralph Macchio, more or less? More. More. No, I'm sorry. This is Damn. Macchio's only second <laughs> film. What? The following year, he will be in The Karate Kid. Also playing a teenager. Also playing a teenager. He's yeah. got a very young this face. This is only his. Yes, I think that he is supposed to be 16 in The Karate Kid. And yeah, he will be and he will be when he's shooting. Holy yeah. shit! Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm terrible at this game. It turns out. Okay, who's left? Rob Lowe. Uh, Rob Lowe didn't do anything though before this, did he? You're right. Rob Lowe has not done anything. This is his first film credit. <gasps> Yay, Rob Lowe. He's the baby. This is the, wow. the first thing that he's, he did. A lot of theater before regional theater, mostly. Okay. Uh, but this is his first film credit. What about Diane Lane? Then is Diane Lane like up there because she's giving me veteran in this performance. Very good, Grasshopper. Diane Lane is the Woo! most experienced, despite the fact that she is only 18 years old. This is her seventh film. Seventh. Wow. I love Diane Lane. I love her too. And I think she's great as Cherry Valance, which is she's important to me because I love Cherry Valance. What a performance. Yeah. What a command of her instrument. Mm. At such an early age, just can hold that camera yes. in the most amazing way. Yeah. Well, and what I love is that she gets a lot of lines that could be considered heavy-handed, and she throws them away perfectly. Mm. They're so good. They make her such a real person. So that leaves us with Dylan and with C. Thomas Howell, I guess. Oh, and with Swayze, too. Okay, okay, all right. I'm going to say Swayze because he's the oldest that he has more. Swayze is the oldest. However, this is only his second film. Second he film. started as a dancer, was on Broadway for a while, was in Greece on Broadway for of a while in the late was. 1970s. Of course. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that. I don't How like good Greece. Is, I don't I like Greece Patrick either, Swayze. but I would watch Patrick Swayze yes. as Danny Zuko for sure. Can we just talk really, really quick about how great Dirty Dancing is? We can. Just really quick, just really quick, just because <laughs> I just happened to notice that both movies were shot in the 80s, but playing the late 60s, and it's a very similar tight shirt, leather so jacket performance. are you suggesting that possibly in the month of November, yes. we will pitch Dirty Dancing as our tangential film, 100%. our alternate for The Outsiders? Please. Interesting. And would you want to watch Dirty Dancing or Dirty Dancing Havana Nights? Shut up. <laughs> in which Patrick Swayze also appears, and which you and I said through, I'm going to say two-thirds of. 
Uh, was it two thirds? I don't. Get that far? I don't know if we got that far. That was Oof. real bad. Yeah. That was a tough one. <laughs> Ooh, Dirty Dancing is an uncontested classic in this so house. Great. In this house, we do not put Baby in a corner. We do not put Baby in a corner, and we have the soundtrack on vinyl. I like that about us. <laughs> that's, that's a good <laughs> one. Yeah. Just a quick check. Are we cool? Yeah, I think we're cool. That leaves us with Matt Dillon, who has, I will just spoil just this game go. for yeah, you. Yeah, Matt yeah. Dillon is second. He has six films already, starting with Over the Edge in 1979. So this is his seventh appearance. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, see Thomas Howell. This is his second film after his debut performance the previous year in Trivia Question. See Thomas Howell's debut performance. I don't know it. Just a little film. Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Wow. I haven't seen that movie in such a long time that I don't remember another kid. It's Elliot and the Big Brother. Yeah, no, he plays Tyler. He is uh, eighth build. So he's a okay. long way down the list. Like uh, someone and, they go trick-or-treating with or something. Yeah, and credited yeah. as Tom Howell, which is Tom actually Howell. kind of adorable. So I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our core cast. We should also okay. mention, of course, very quickly, Leif Garrett, who plays Bob. Mm-hmm. He is a child actor. He's a singer. He has quite an established career already as he comes into The Outsiders. Yeah. He's flat out bad he's in this He's terrible. Film. Yeah. Just flat out bad. Yeah, he's bad. Darren Dalton plays Randy, the other Soch. Uh, it's also not a great performance. No, I think even it's, worse, it's a I would little say. thin. It all comes full circle when we're talking about the movies of the early 1980s. Darren Dalton will appear alongside C. Thomas Howell in Red Dawn, the movie that we mentioned oh, last shit. week. Oh, shit. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Weird. It's a tangly little web. Yes. Here. And you can't forget Tom Waits. Sure you can. <laughs> you stop. Tom Waits as Buck Merrill. He's nice. I like it. I like to, I, hey, I like Tom Waits. Yeah. He's barely in this. He's and it doesn't need to be Tom Waits. Let's be honest. That's true. Anyway, I was happy the to The girl see who follows Matt Dillon as he's leaving the oh bar shirtless, who gives the world's biggest take, Just is more significant the to this film <laughs> than Tom Waits is. <laughs> Nothing against Tom Waits, but it doesn't need to be him. Oh, oh, and of course, S.E. Hinton. S.E. Hinton, who is so good and so charming playing Lovely. the nurse. It's one scene. It's so great. Mm-hmm. I love her. Yes, yes, yeah. She plays the nurse who is in Dallas's room. Uh, and she says something like, I can't wait till you get out of here or something. It's cute. You can see the affection on her face when she says it. Many of the actors came back to Tulsa just a few years ago as they were funding and then opening the commemorative museum, which is in the yes. real Curtis house. Now mm-hmm. you can go to Tulsa and see that, which is pretty great, honestly. Yeah, we'll a lot of the actors that. came back to town and talked glowingly about working with S.E. Hinton, who, of course, was in her mid-30s at the time of the shoot. She had grown up, as people tend to do. Mm. With all that said... Shall we get into the business of the film? Yes, yes. So we are going to break down the expanded, complete novel cut. But if you watch the theatrical cut, just tune out for like 15 minutes and then come back. (laughs) And you can pick up with us when Matt Dillon's on screen and it's going to be fine. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was so shocking when we started the theatrical version and we were fully 20 minutes into the film. Just from the jump. so much important, I would say crucial setup. Crucial, yeah. Just on the The cutting room The inciting incident. I can side with... Warner Brothers of 1983, perhaps thinking that 133 minutes is is a touch too long. But wow, 91 minutes is too short. Too short. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Anyway, let's start with the genuinely terrible opening credit song. I guess we must. It's in both of them. Somehow can, it survived both versions. We can perhaps delay that just a moment to talk about literally the opening second of the movie where we get Pony Boy sitting at his desk. Oh, yeah. Opening his composition book and composing <laughs> that famous first line. Yes. He is immediately arresting. He is immediately great. Yeah. The lighting throughout this film is Gorgeous. saturated and, and old fashioned, you know, as we very. keep saying here, very, very technicolor, you know, very, very 1960s. Yes. But it feels so luminous and so real yeah. throughout that yeah. I just, I can't help but adore it. The way we get those silhouetted shots on the skyline too, we keep going back to that yes. as, a, as a cinematic trick. Really genuinely It's beautiful. Lovely. No, I completely agree. But you're right. Then we must inevitably move into our title sequence, which is different in the two versions of the film, but is sadly exactly the same length. This song is written, uh, scored by Carmine Coppola, Mm -hmm. and then lyrics are provided and the song is performed by Stevie Wonder, who who is so great. We love Stevie Wonder. I know that I'm on thin ice because I went to bat to defend Endless Love. You did. The song, not the movie. Uh Uh-huh. This song sucks. This song sucks. (laughs) (laughs) But at least it takes forever. I completely agree. 
to the point that when it came up finally that it was Stevie Wonder, I was like, ah, oh, knife in my heart. I want to love it, but it's terrible. It's not and unlike. And it's atonal. It does not fit the film at oh, all. Oh, not at all. Not that any of the music does, as we previously mentioned, but yeah. If you haven't seen the theatrical version and you want to know what the score is that we've been discussing here, it kind of sounds like this. It kind of sounds yeah, like the kind of music that you would yeah. play when it's time to turn out the lights in a nursing home. You know, it's the <laughs> end of the night in a nursing home. So you want to put on something soothing, but also something that will maybe make it okay if you don't make it till morning. You know, <laughs> like if this is the last thing you hear, you might not feel bad about your life ending in this way. It's so awful. And, and really of course, the, the slow sepia-tinted credits yeah. do nothing to raise the excitement and raise the blood. No. But so then... So old-fashioned. So old school. We get straight into the action, although not into the action of this beat-by-beat -beat breakdown, because Ponyboy is about to emerge from the Circle Cinema yes. in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where you have shown a film. Well, no, I have not shown a film. You are in a film that was shown. Yes, I had my big screen debut. At Circle Cinema uh, for a short film that I was in, my friend Matt Bars wrote and directed called Distance, uh, a weird little horror story, not even a horror quite, but it's like adjacent. It's it's in that like odd zombie, kind eerie, Lynchian. Lynchian. Yeah. Yeah, 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 just a cool little film I got to be a part of. Uh, and yeah, that's the first time I walked into a movie house to see myself on a screen acting. It was pretty fucking cool, actually. And it happened to be that cinema, it, it, which is it, awesome. It's so cool because, as I said before, I had only seen the theatrical release of this movie. So I hadn't seen the moment because when, when I went to Circle Cinema, it's like, oh, the outsider cinema. And there's like pictures of the kids all over the place. Yeah. Like, oh, this is so cool. But I didn't really realize that I was going to see that cinema the first thing. Like, <laughs> it's, it's like the first scene that we get there in Tulsa. And it was actually very exciting. That felt really cool. I'll drop a couple of the pictures from that day into do, the show notes of this do. episode. There that was a, a great day. Fun. It really was. And yeah. a great cinema, right? In yeah. the heart of downtown Tulsa. It's a really cool place. It is cool. Yeah. That whole area has become like a arts district and it's, it's neat. We see Pony Boy walk home from the movie theater. He's harassed immediately and immediately. consistently. Mm -hmm. And then finally assaulted by the socials, the socials, mm. these preppy ass bullies who drive around in a cool car all day, I guess. <laughs> because having a cool car is not a symbol of social division, interestingly. It's not as though they are in some other kind of car. It's all the kids understand that Mustangs are cool. Yes. So that's, <laughs> that's what we want. a tough car. <laughs> and then they are fought off by the arrival of the other greasers. And we get to see for the first time in this film, Tom Cruise. That's right. Yes. Tell me all about Tom Cruise yes. in this movie. Uh, he comes out swinging, quite literally, like quite they all do. Literally. All the boys come like, you know, running and jumping over cars and over uh, fences, trying to come to the defense of Pony Boy. And we get our very first Tom Cruise stunt, which I just we thought do. was so cool. Yeah. It is surprising. Yeah. He is pulling one of the Soches out of the car window as that car very quickly backs up. He plants his feet and skids. Yeah. I don't know, 12, 14, 16 feet It's back, so cool. Just next to a real muscle car. It's in a white, so you can tell that there's no trickery happening yeah. here. That's just Cruise committing to the bit. Yep. That is something I think we're going to see again. We're going to see a lot of that. Yeah. Who strikes you out of this ensemble as we are introduced to all of the Greaser oh, kids? Oh, God. They're all so good. They're all so electric. Um, I don't know if I can pick a favorite. I really don't know that I can. I think the casting is pretty damn spot on. Did you have a standout? Not a standout. I think that Ralph Macchio was doing something very different in this film than almost everyone else. Sure. He, he and Matt Dillon both. So, Oh, that's true. Dillon is doing something very different in entirely the other direction yes. than, mm -hmm. than Macchio. Yes. Uh, he is so folded in on himself and he is so small and so scared yeah. that it takes time for him to open up. And he is dominated, I think, in this scene by all of the other greasers. Sure. We disagree about Matt Dillon. And we I would do. love to hear at this point your defense. No, it's not a defense. You don't have to defend him. He's a grown man. He can take care of himself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to hear genuinely what it is that you love about this performance. Yeah, I mean, love is strong, but it works for me uh, because he is he is doing something totally different. But Dallas Winston as a character is so different. Like he's so much more hard edged. He's so much more emotional. He's so much more fractious and uh, violent. And I'm getting all of that from from Matt Dillon. He's just like a much bigger personality than any of the other boys. And it it works for me. In fact, it surprised me because... 
I remember one of the things that I didn't like watching the movie when I was a kid was like, oh, Dallas is supposed to be like a towhead blonde. Why do they have this dark haired kid up here? And the dumb things that bother you when you're younger. You're right. It's only when you're a kid that you let silly things like that get to you. The internet is not mostly populated by grown men engaging in that kind of nitpickery. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> At least it's about something important like Star Wars. <laughs> Uh, yeah. In any case, he seemed like a weird pick for me when I saw it when I was younger. But now I like him. I, I think there's something just hard edged and emotional about him that that works for me. Yeah. I don't know. He, he to me is a standout. You think he's a standout for the wrong reasons, though. You think he's chewing the scenery? I think that's a I think that's fair. If that's I do. It, yeah, I do. I think he's he's oftentimes very poor mm. and oftentimes feels that he is giving a degree of of soap opera hyperrealism oh. that distinguishes him uncomfortably for me from the other kids who are giving such naturalistic and grounded performances. Sure. That's uh, fair. I, I do think you're right. I think there's an element of Dallas that is performative. And I think that he is, I think it seems to me that Dylan is trying to access that performativity. Yeah. But it's difficult to play someone who is themselves a bad actor. It is difficult to play someone who is yes, I know what you're saying. giving yeah. a thin performance that is not supposed to be convincing to the people around him. Right. It also doesn't help that I can only associate this performance with James Hurley from Twin Peaks, famously <laughs> the worst character in Twin Peaks. Sure, I can totally see and that. And it's just too similar. It, yeah. It feels like such a flat take on a greaser, too. It's such a, like conventional Hollywood version of sure. one of these characters. Of like the moody yeah. bad kid from the wrong side of the tracks. Sure. I think we broadly agree about all of the other actors with the exception that Swayze is too old. With, with the understanding that Swayze the understanding, is probably too old. Even though I like what he's but doing. But nonetheless brilliant. Yes. The only guy that we disagree on besides that I think is Rob Lowe. Yeah. Who I think is giving this very un-Rob Lowe performance. He's giving this very submissive kind of thoughtful and nervy performance nervy yeah which is sure. not at all what i get from roblo in the rest of his career honestly he is about to break out you know we mentioned earlier the brat pack we are about to arrive at the heyday of these actors in the yeah. 1980s they are going to make a string of films back to back they are going to run hollywood and then many of them will be ruined by alcohol and drugs yeah. and have oh. to come back from that in the long term Roblo, though, is never going to give a performance like this again in his career. Not one that I've seen anyway. Mm, that's so interesting. He's so small in his body. He his, his shoulders are so bowed. But he's also got this lightness of touch. Yeah. There's a scene later that we probably won't have time to talk about when we get to it where we're watching Mickey Mouse cartoons on the TV. Yeah, yeah. And he is so enchanted by them and distracted by them. And he's having this great little byplay with Tom Cruise in that moment. The scene is not about them. No. The scene is not following them or tracking them. The scene is about watching Patrick Swayze interact with C. Thomas Howell. Mm -hmm. But it is still so natural and youthful and lovely. And, and just, yeah, he works for me a yeah. great deal. Yeah, no, he's he's lovely. He certainly is. I think it's the accent work that bothers me more than anything, if I'm honest. I will not defend the accent work. See, like as yeah. an Oklahoman, when somebody gives a bad Oklahoma accent, yeah. it's painful. It Most hurts. of them, very good in this film. Yeah, I think. yeah. Swayze's kind of half trying. It comes and goes. But when Which it comes, Which I like it's the best because good. that's, to me, what I see and hear the most of. Sure. Is that just like every now and then it's you slip into something yeah. like that. But especially since it's like a fairly urban setting. Yeah. It's it's just very different. Like we live in uh, a university town, so there's not a whole lot of like oaky accent happening here. Yeah. But when we drive 15 minutes even down the road. Oh, not even 15. Not even 15. <laughs> when we go down into Noble, which is the town that's like right behind us and take our kids to the water park that's over there, um, splash pad, not a water park. And the kids come out to play with our kids. They sound so different. That's some real oaky voices right yeah, there. Yeah. I remember our youngest was like, why does he talk like a cowboy? <laughs> You're like, hush, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so there are like strong oaky accents, don't get me wrong, but they're just not typically in such an urban setting. By and large, though, I think the accent work throughout the film is pretty good. Like, I, would say I think so. the boys do a pretty nice job. Yeah, I they think, don't oversell it too much. I think Machio and Howell both do extremely well. Yeah. And they are the ones that are important, honestly, yeah. as far as that Definitely. goes. I think particularly given their youth and particularly given their... Their their innocence, their their lack of artifice. They are sure. not performing in the way that basically everyone else is yeah. performing. Two bits putting on a show, even Soda Pop to a certain degree, because he's so optimistic, because he's so up and driven, is yeah. kind of doing a thing. Steve has this like swagger and snarl. Yeah. We should probably talk actually about, yeah, about Tom Cruise's mouth. Yes. <laughs> so 
uh, evident in yes. this particular film. Yes. That was one of my first notes. Like, what is going on with Tom Cruise's teeth? Is there a weird dental prosthetic yes. put in place? And the answer is no. There is, in fact, the absence of a dental prosthetic. Tom Cruise had split one of his teeth much earlier in his career and had replaced it with a cap and chose in conversation with Coppola, to remove it for this film. And not only remove it, but to artificially snarl his top lip to make his teeth look more prominent yeah. throughout. And it it's works. It's a really great character choice. Yeah. He's a weird looking dude in this film. He's a weird looking dude in this film. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. But not without his, I don't know, sparkle. There is definitely something compelling about him when he's on screen. Yeah. He has so much enthusiasm i'm gonna call it yeah he's just like i think about the scene when they're all going to the rumble and he's just bouncing he he's so, so alive yeah yeah so we move through the sequence where we're effectively introduced by proxy to pony boy it's a lot of people talking to pony boy and about pony boy about who he is sure if you just didn't think about movies and books so much then maybe you know <laughs> yeah it works really nicely. I think it's so striking that it's absent from the yeah. theatrical version. It is. And it then is. we move into a scene that is perhaps less essential and certainly more awkward, but is striking nonetheless in its own way. This is the scene with uh, Pony Boy and Soda Pop in bed. This is an interesting one because I, I was going to ask, uh, in fact, on Instagram the other day, I was thinking about this. If there is a queer reading of The Outsiders, because I am always curious about that. People who like will have movies when they're growing up that mm. they definitely felt had like a queer gaze to them. Uh, and I don't think that the theatrical version does at all. But I think that this complete story... Oh, there's no complete way novel. that the theatrical version doesn't have a queer gaze following on Tumblr. Pony it's, Boy you know, and Johnny so right. are so intimate through so much of this film. They are so like close. And, and yeah, That's really, true. when they fall asleep in the lot together, dreaming of a better life somewhere else, if they just oh weren't God, so constrained so right. about being greasers and so... Like, Were they just people, just ordinary people? You're so right. Absolutely. No, of course there is. Of course there is. can be laid onto this film. Looking at this film with a queer sensitivity, mm -hmm. here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with two brothers sharing a bed. There's nothing wrong with two brothers being physically intimate with one another. Right. There is something wrong with Rob Lowe being physically intimate with anyone <laughs> because it feels weird. They don't have fraternal chemistry. Yeah. Swayze has it with both of them. He weirdly, does. He sure but does. They do not yeah. have it with each other. Yeah. Hardly at all. And it's just a little odd. It is a little odd. It's a I think weird. it's a very sweet scene. And I think they're it's both good too. in it. And this is the problem is that you just can't account for chemistry. Yes. Sometimes you get two people on screen who are supposed to want each other and they clearly don't. Sometimes you get two people on screen who don't want each other, but they look as though they do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it That's seems the quite magic romantic. Of filmmaking, you guys. Yeah. It is, yes. Romantic is exactly mm -hmm. the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem like if you didn't know anything at all about what you were getting yourself into, <laughs> that you would be curious about the nature of the relationship of these two brothers. Particularly yeah. when we inadvertently land on Soda Pop's rampant heterosexuality at the end of the scene because he's going to marry Sandy. And what's it like to be in love? Oh, it's pretty great to be in love. I'm going to marry this girl, but I'll probably keep working until you're out of school so I can have. It's just. It's doing so a lot. And it's lovely. It's mm -hmm. it's nice character work, but yeah. it is in this context. It feels a little like we're hiding behind it. It feels as though reinforced compulsory oh. heteronormativity <laughs> right here. Yeah, absolutely. Now that you mention it, that's funny. Yeah. The next morning, Ponyboy wakes and we catch up with the theatrical cut of the film because he yeah. goes off to meet Dallas with Johnny in tow for a day of, well, what is it that Magdalene says? What are we up to today? Nothing legal? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So we very quickly go to a diner and there's kind mm -hmm. of a rumble there. And then we go harass some kids who are playing cards in the park. Yeah, just show that we're rough and tumble boys. Yeah. I think this is maybe part of my problem with Dallas is that I am not on his side when he is picking on, no. you know, eight-year-olds. But that's so important, though, I think. I, I think that's one of the great things about the story, the book especially, but also in the film, is that Dallas is not a good or nice guy. Like... There are shitheads on both sides. Yeah. And I think that Essie Hinton is really quick to point that out. And it sh and it shows up in the film as well. well. And even then, it's not that simple because he is turned by his time in prison. That is textual. That, yeah, yeah. We yeah, can speculate true. how much that is true, but at least that is asserted by the text. Yeah, that he is, he is hardened by his time in prison. Mm-hmm. We then wind up at the drive-in movie theater. We, we skip under the fence there and we're introduced almost immediately to the wonderful Diane Lane, yes. to the amazing Cherry Valance. The sequence is fantastic. If, if so you fun. weren't already on board with this film, if perhaps you were watching the theatrical cut and mm -hmm. you hadn't had all the great stuff earlier with the greasers en masse, I think it's pretty impossible not to be charmed by the sequence. Yeah, I think so. I, I think this, this is great for uh, Ponyboy and Johnny are both 
just being themselves so beautifully here. Just like a little bit awkward because Dallas is being a real jerk. Like so awful. Real gross and awful. Yeah. And they're both like telling him to calm down, but also they they're I mean, he's just much bigger and scarier than them. So they're not mm. like, you know, really coming to the rescue in any big way. But they do, you know, de-escalate the situation enough to get him out of there. This is also one of those moments, one of the rare moments that the film feels as spontaneous and as unstructured as the book. Because at the start of the sequence, when we're sitting on the bleachers watching the film and Dallas begins hitting very awkwardly, very, very aggressively, aggressively yeah. on Cherry, he slips from his chair. Yes. <laughs> that was unscripted. That was right. an actual onset accident. As you can tell, you pointed this out to me when we were watching it last yeah. night, that C. Thomas Howell just does a dead take down the barrel of camera and yeah. is not laughing as Ponyboy, is laughing at another actor's misfortune yes. on set. Yes. And like looks right at the crew as they all kind of share a laugh. And instead of resetting and taking that shot again, we just kind of move to a different angle yeah. and have Dallas kind of say the same things <laughs> over again. Yeah. And it feels like it feels theatrical. It feels as though there has been a a, a mishap on stage, oh, and the actors are kind of internally resetting and and coming into it again. Yeah. But obviously, that's not what's happening. It's mm -hmm. just a little improvisation from Coppola in terms of composing and compositing yeah, the scene yeah. together. We get that a few times from Dallas. There's a few scenes in this film where Dallas will begin by asking a question or or asserting something to be true, and then we will have some conversation. And he will circle back to exactly the first point that he made. Mm. We do that with, you guys want to get some food when yeah. we get to the church much later. Sure. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if Matt Dillon was just having trouble with the lines. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons that I want to do the the chapter by chapter read along mm -hmm. of, of the novel is to look very carefully at Dallas's dialogue sure. and to look at to look at really all of these characters as they are composed in Ponyboy's vision mm -hmm. and out of Ponyboy's vision. Like what is subjective and what is objective about these characterizations oh. as they are presented to us? The text is so rich. Yeah. It would be such an interesting really project. Is. These movies, by the way, that are playing in the drive-in theater are Muscle Beach Party and Beach Blanket Bingo, 1964 <laughs> and 1965 respectively. Absolutely real films. Absolutely part of so this terrible. beach party phenomenon yeah. where these incredibly cheap films will be turned out by the dozens oh. in order to fill very cheap movie theater seats and, and drive-in seats too, wow. I guess. Big Lana Del Rey vibes. If you've oh, been into sure. Lana Del Rey for yeah, the last yeah. few years, like this whole like saturated, sexy, falling apart, dystopian yeah, kind of 60s vibe. Totally. Yeah, very Lana Del Rey. Love it. So Cherry and Ponyboy have this nice conversation while Dallas is off getting Cokes. He comes back, Cherry dumps the Coke on him, mm -hmm. telling him to cool off. Great moment. Yep. Great. The audience cheered. They got to their feet. They applauded for 15 <laughs> minutes straight. The boys move up to sit with the girls as Dallas leaves. Then 2-Bit shows up. We get to go through all of that. We get to go through Tim and all of that, showing that the greasers are not a unified whole. Yes. That there is tribalism within mm -hmm. the community of greasers. But ultimately- and individualism too. They are all opposed to the socias and unified, the enemy of my enemy, right? Yes, absolutely. The five leave the drive-in together, only to be immediately, in inevitably, set upon by Bob and Randy. Yeah. There's almost a fight where we're, mm -hmm. you know, really building up the inevitable conflagration, the, yeah. the, the, the fireworks that will erupt when these two forces clash. Estevez smashing the bottle on the fence and then drawing his knife. <laughs> yes. Is so surprisingly physical. It is. Yeah. It's scares me when he then like thrusts the broken bottle at pony boy who just yeah. grabs it so quick i'm like boys be more careful oh my god i Someone's have gonna seen lose a finger. that scene twice watching the film in its context and i have watched it separately twice more just to study what he is doing it is so fast it is so aggressive it is so chilling yeah and such a weird foreshadowing of violence really yes yeah and just before the socias show up also is where we get we understand now that pony boy believes that Derry, his older brother, does not like him at all, doesn't doesn't yeah. want him around. And everybody else is like, no, you're reading this wrong. But he feels it very strongly. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. We yeah. saw elements of it in the opening scene, but Swayze yes. is so charming that it's difficult to read his, like, how serious he is about yeah. the lines that he is setting. He has that line to, uh, to Soda Pop about when I need help from my little brother about how to deal with my little brother, I'll ask you little brother. Yeah, yeah. Which is like, it's oddly architected uh -huh. in a way that, the Lifted first time, directly from the book. Yeah, the first time I watched it, I was unsure whether that was completely sincere or if he is being playful. But no, it's completely sincere, in fact. Yeah, 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 I do think so. Is it odd that the film doesn't mention that their parents have been dead for eight months? 
It is a little bit odd. Yeah, cause, because it, it feels watching the film that they've been gone for years. It feels watching the film that everyone has been doing this forever, that there is yeah. no change, that there is, perhaps this is, you know, in keeping with the central theme of the piece, but that there is no hope, that it, it is only ever this. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So there's almost a fight with the Soches, but Cherry explains social dynamics to Ponyboy and leaves with one of two lines. We're, we're going to get to the line about Dallas in just a moment. Before that, let's rewind to when they are fetching Pepsis and popcorn from the soda shop. Mm -hmm. She has a line about things are bad all over. Yes. And the equivalence experienced by the Soches and the Greasers. Later, Randy will have a similar take. Yes. But again, in the in the film, they're both very thin. There, there's not enough. I think it's so clear that the socials have all of the power, all of the breaks, all of the money, all of the privilege. Yeah, and it's not addressed nearly as much in the film. It's like, in what way are things tough for you, right. Terry Valance? Like, how exactly? Well, it's a real, you know, more money, more problems kind of right? situation, yeah. which is a tough social read, especially now. I think. Yeah. When Definitely. we realize, separated, of course, from the writing of the book and certainly separated from the making of the film, we realize now more than ever that so many of these problems, so many of these inequalities are systemic. Absolutely. That it's not a question yeah, of personal opportunity, no. but it is a deliberate and conscious economic and, and uh, social oppression. Absolutely. So that's already a little bewildering. And then we get the line from Cherry that my line in my note is just, what? With like seven A's. <laughs> Quote, I hope I never see Dallas Winston again. If I do, I'll probably fall in love with him. Yep. Well, to quote a great thinker on the subject of The Outsiders, what? <laughs> this is interesting about Cherry. The, uh, this idea that she is drawn to two violent and mean-spirited men, and she knows this about herself and detests it about herself. I find really interesting. Interesting. And again, a, a very mature read for an author who's 15 to, to say, to, to see a young woman who is deliberately courting danger and knows it about herself and dislikes it about herself is interesting to me. It's particularly interesting and particularly challenging when reading The Outsiders, because as anyone who has listened to us talk about stories basically at all will know. We are, I think, resistant to the biographical interpretation of a text, that yeah. we want to separate the art from the artist, and we want to look at the art as a core text on its own terms and interpret it according to what is on the page or what is on the yeah. screen. And it's tempting, when you're looking at The Outsiders, to talk about how amazing this is. It was written by a 15-year-old. It yeah. was written by a 16-year-old. It was published when she was 18. And it's tempting to use that knowledge as a way of either elevating things that we think are particularly wonderful interpretations mm -hmm. that we think are particularly rich and thoughtful or to excuse elements symbolism imagery right. themes dialogue that we don't like so much it's easy to say well she was only 15 yeah i'm kind of resistant to do either of those things i, I want to be yeah. pure about the text but it is very difficult well particularly cherry is our only female perspective that we get in this uh, putting aside that the book was authored by a female person but uh who was a self-described tomboy for what that is worth to have this very feminine character who comes in repeating what is a trope i suppose of you know the girl who falls for the bad boys but not wholly because the first thing that we get from her directly in the film and and as is related to us in the course of the book, the first thing that she does is leave Bob and Randy because they're drinking. Exactly. I could criticize it that it is so often a trope because we like to place femininity as a soothing and de-escalating and nonviolent presence in these violent masculine situations. And that she wants to believe herself as a taming influence, I suppose. That's interesting. So to present herself, to, to have an awareness of herself as a thing that will be inevitably sullied by its contact with the world, that her power is to do good, right. but in the doing of that good, 
she will succumb to temptation of one form or another. Or be harmed or or be a, a victim to either mm. a purposeful or an accidental violent act. Interesting. Yeah. Again, we need to get into the text of this book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the boys walk away. They approach Johnny's house. This is a charming scene. Just a lot of good energy and chemistry between the three of them, I think. Yeah. We see his parents fighting through the window in the world's most staged Awful theatrical pantomime. diorama so right there in yes. the lit window. But nonetheless effective. Yeah. Like Because we are so deeply in the aesthetic of a 1960s kind of somewhat grandiose, somewhat yeah, yeah, epic kind of social drama, in a lot of right? Ways, yeah. Exactly. Because we are there so thoroughly in terms of the score when we get the score and, and all of the cinematography and to some extent the performances too, mm -hmm. it kind of works. It feels very stagey, yes, yeah. but it doesn't detract. It feels very urgent. Yeah. Th this is one of those um, moments where I couldn't help thinking about the actual act of filming this scene mm. and just how many lights they must have had in this neighborhood Anytime. to get that like blue cast yeah. everywhere and all of the depths and shadows like the lighting must have been out of control right because we're shooting this on film there's no digital yeah. color correction happening here mm -hmm. and you can see in a couple of shots particularly when we're at the drive-in for example where we're really not flooding them with light yeah those shots are grainy. They get grained out. There's Absolutely. just not a lot mm -hmm. of natural light for the film mm -hmm. to do its work there. But you're right. When we're at, they must have giant lighting racks. Huge light panels. Yeah. Just enormous. So much so, in fact, that they can flatten the actors and pop them from the background, making it look like a composite shot, even when yeah. there's no reason for it Let's to be a composite talk about shot. Composite shots. Yeah. I don't like them, first of all. They, we get a handful. They yeah. basically never work. I, th I think they so are. Yeah. I will say, in, in Coppola's defense here, they are most notably used when we're doing something deliberate and impressionistic. We get the stars above the lot right. when Johnny and Pony Boy are, are moving towards sleep. We get the weird splash of blood as, uh, as Pony Boy falls oh, unconscious. Awful. Yes. Uh huh. In the fountain. We get the sunsets themselves, of course, which I can understand wanting to artificially light those sunsets mm -hmm. because you don't really want to rely on the minute and a half of sunlight that you get oh per God. day where yes. it looks like that <laughs> so even true. in oklahoma it's, so it's a vanishingly small when you're dealing with young actors when you're dealing with incredibly Absolutely. complicated setups no just light it artificially just it. yeah and have it look like have it look like gone with the wind mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is obviously such an interesting reference point that we'll get to in just a moment yeah well and i think also the composite shots do reinforce that we are in pony boy's memory like i think that might be something that that coppola is doing in adaptation in a way to really anchor us in Pony Boy's POV. Like I think of the shot, particularly when we get uh, Johnny's face large in the frame, but right behind him is the dead body of Bob. And that is one of the more effective yeah, yeah, pieces because, of composition. Uh, just the way the human eye works, you mm -hmm. get to focus on one of those two, two things. Yeah. You don't get to focus on them both. But memory isn't necessarily that way. You, you can hold both things in your mind or the two superimpose each other in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so I think in that instance, it's at least an interesting choice, if not particularly effective. But then when we deliberately evoke memory, as when Ponyboy wakes in the church and he sees through the doorway yes. Patrick Swayze cooking breakfast, yeah. which is a genuinely great shot. That's actually a really nice piece of composition. That's some nice. great matching that's happening mm -hmm. there. It feels too naturalistic to the world. It doesn't feel intrusive or impressionistic enough mm, to communicate the same elements yeah. of memory. There's just not, there's not generally in this film a very cohesive, it's not cohesive. set of, of yeah. technical standards. Yeah. We also get all of this canted angle work. We get oh, all of yeah, these Dutch, the Dutch angles. angles. Dumb. Which don't ever really seem to communicate something intentional. They don't ever yeah. seem to communicate, as Dutch angles often do, you I know, mean, something upset, something being off balance, something being sinister. I can argue that like, as the book goes on and you see Pony Boy is getting quite ill and a bit delirious and out of his own head, like maybe that's some of the canted angles, particularly in the hospital but and when we some go of them, see Johnny. Yes. And others, but, absolutely but not. not. Some through. of them are very no, I know. Yeah. Sometimes it's just composition that we needed to fit these two things in the frame. <laughs> And they're awkwardly arrayed, yeah. so let's just count the count the camera. Yeah, it's interesting. We do get, I will say, well, we can basically skip ahead at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Pony Boy and Johnny fall asleep in the lot, talking about somewhere green. Uh, Pony Boy uh. eventually wakes and goes home. He is then pushed, though he will later say hit. Yeah, by yeah. his elder brother, he runs off into the night, goes back to Johnny, who is somehow sleeping under a pile of newspapers. <laughs> 
<laughs> Even that's the windiest this, night. <laughs> here's an inescapable element of shooting in Oklahoma, yes. you guys, from people who have done it. You can't escape the wind. You cannot. It's it so is true. constant and it is always. I'm so glad they shot here, though, because I have to say it does just do so much in those opening sequences where Pony Boy is running through the back streets. Uh, when we're uh, up at the church, all of the external shots where there are like wildflowers. Yeah. To see these spaces that do feel like the ones that I grew up in, that, that that are so true, like to recognize the wildflowers and the architecture and the way poor housing looks and has the housing since in the particular. 40s. As someone who has traveled extensively through this country, the housing is distinctly Oklahoman. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it's just so much more effective than the the film that I always call to mind is Thelma and Louise, which is supposed to start in Arkansas and they drive through Oklahoma and it's so clearly California the whole time, like obviously all the palm trees and just the way that the the architecture is that streets are laid out it's just different in the midwest so i love that he did the work to shoot in tulsa it makes a huge difference pony boy and johnny go to the park to calm down i love how quickly pony boy's passion for this abates how how firm he is and we're running away that's it it's done ah uh, you know uh, it's, I just need to walk and I'll calm down and then I'll go yeah. home and it'll be fine. Like, it's, Which is so true. It's very mature. Yeah. It's it, This is a kid who has faced adversity and who knows what the actual limits are, which of course makes it so much worse when we break those limits yeah. immediately because they are set upon by the socials. This is a really great standoff. The cinematography is very – this is the first time that we start getting what is to my mind West Side Story cinematography. Interesting. Like, it feels very – like so many of the fights feel – and are, of course, choreographed. Yes. But feel choreographed, mm. feel like dance moves in a way that the immediacy and the ugliness of that first fight didn't. Yeah. That's we start getting it now. We get it a little when Dallas and the boys go to uh, the diner before we go to the movie theater and that guy pulls a flick knife and, and there's the standoff yeah, and then the cops yeah, show up. Sure. And it's that also feels very kind of West Side Story, very stagey. Mm -hmm. But here we get it quite a lot. We get the uh, immersion of Pony Boy into the fountain and we Another get the, the spill shot. of mm -hmm. blood across. And again, in defense of Coppola's uh, cinematography here, that brilliant rotating camera shot as Pony Boy comes back to consciousness yeah, looking like at Johnny. That? Yeah, I do. I think that's mm. it's very imaginative. It's really disorienting mm -hmm. in a way that that puts us firmly in it. It's not quite, I think, a POV shot strictly. Not strictly. But it sure feels like yeah, a POV impressionistically shot. Yeah, impressionistically so. Yeah. Yeah. This is, of course, the turning point of the film. How do you feel about Johnny? Let's setting aside the, the cinematography of it all and talking narratively for a second. How do you feel about Johnny being used as the fulcrum around which this plot turns? That that Pony Boy is a witness to his own demise in a sense that that he is present for this event but not active in this event sure uh i mean i i love johnny cade um i think that he's a great character i think that ralph macchio performs him really beautifully too i think his smallness his his scaredness and his being on the back foot makes makes him an interesting I was going to say protagonist. He's not a protagonist. It makes him an interesting... Well, in a different version of the story, yeah. he absolutely is the protagonist. Yeah. If you follow the school of thought that suggests that your protagonist is the person with the most to lose and the most to gain, that, sure. it, that, that is ownership of a story, yeah, then that's Johnny, Johnny is in some sense. He has been so broken down by violence. He has been mm. so dehumanized by violence. We get those references to uh, how gregarious he was before he was beaten by the socials, before he got the scar on his face from the rings, right? A mm. symbol of wealth and power themselves. Yes. And also weirdly like a, a symbol of an almost feudal domination, right? The idea of mm. kiss the ring being such a symbol of submission. Oh, I like that. And yeah. that Johnny is literally beaten down by these symbols of power wielded by those who possess that power. So good. And is turned into something other than he is, except that the action that he takes, in, in a more traditional story, he would be driven to violence by violence. But here he is driven to violence by violence inflicted upon another because he is worried yes. for Ponyboy. Yeah. He is not beaten by the socialists. He is knocked down. He is kicked. Right. And then the socialists turn their attention to Ponyboy. And that is what triggers Johnny to take action. And even as I'm laying that out, I'm, I'm, I'm rocked back on my heels. That is so complicated and interesting and mm. nuanced. There's so much depth there and so much that we might interpret and analyze and speculate about when considering S.E. Hinton's kind of moral schema. When, when mm. we're, and, and not just like a pre-existing moral schema, but we are invited to look at the ways that people are changed by violence. Yes. But it's not 
a simple transformative process. It's not a one-to-one -one process. No. Later when we're talking to Soda Pop about why do you like to fight? And he's like, oh, it's like dancing. It's like sports, you know? Mm -hmm. It's this unchanging, it, it's actually a virtuous quality to be ready to rumble, <laughs> as it were. As it were, <laughs> Yes. I find it so interesting to try and track how these characters change and are changed, right? The idea that Johnny is changed by the application of structured power mm. through the symbolism of the ring and the privilege of the socias. Dallas is changed by the apparatus, by the institution of prison. Yes. That these are different kinds of systemic violence, the, the violence of the system against the individual. Yeah. There, there's, yeah, and I completely agree. There's so much there. And, and there's also something I think very feral about Johnny. Like when he, he's so frightened that right. he acts in ways that are counter to his character. It's that interesting inversion. Again, it's that interesting complexity. Again, you're right. He's so cowed. He's so afraid. He's so, uh, yes, animalistic, so feral. Mm -hmm. But his action is in the defense of another. Yes. It's not to run and hide, which would be a much more kind of commonplace sure. and prosaic version of the scene is that 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 Johnny abandons Ponyboy in his hour of need, that that he flees, and then we kind of reintegrate him back into our community mm -hmm. toward the end of the story. But no, there's none of that. It, it's it's phenomenally rich. Yeah, yeah. From there, we go to the well. This is an interesting set. We go to the bar question mark where yeah. there is a party question mark where <laughs> Dallas is living question mark. <laughs> I'm a little unsure yeah. about what we're taking from this. This, of course, is Tom Waits. He greets us at the mm -hmm. door. And then Matt Dillon walks around without his shirt for like 15 solid minutes. Can't be mad about it. You really can't. He is a <laughs> fine looking figure of a man. That is for sure. I also think that he is pretty good in this scene. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. I like him here. in this scene really well. Mm -hmm. He works for me less and less as he gets more and more heightened. Elevated, sure. Uh, but when he is taking care of business when he is is very present in the moment and is really not putting on a show for these boys because these boys have just proved that they are more like peers than he thought. Yes. He's yeah. just more grounded. It's a, it's a nicer performance. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a lovely moment for Dallas Winston to just be called upon for help and mm. to immediately rise to it and give away, you know, a fat load of money, a gun, his own $50 coat. Fifty dollars and yeah. a gun and his coat. And yes. his hideout. Yeah. Like... He gives everything that he has to give for those boys. It's pretty lovely, actually. It, it and you is. see why Johnny Hero worships him the way that he does. Yeah. We cut to the train. We we board the freight train to go to Jay Mountain, to go to yeah. Windricksville. Windricksville, Jay Mountain. Okay. Sure. This, this, again, you were talking about like the way we, we play with the environment. <laughs> if you were curious, no mountains around Tulsa. It is a hillier part, uh, especially just east of Tulsa. But you get some hills. That's what's great. Because when we get to the church, there's also not a mountain also there either. Also not a mountain there. Definitely a quite flat I area. I choose to believe so that Jay Mountain is the local name for a hill a outside hill. of town. And that is very Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it though? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we set up shop in the church eventually. This is actually the one cut in the theatrical version that I really like, is that we don't have to get all the way to the church. We just kind of... Oh, we do sure. The all the walking and, and the guys, the, the oil church. derricks yeah. and all that. Yeah. It's a little bit of shoe leather that we don't yeah. need. Don't need. There. Literal. The cut, <laughs> yes. <literally. laughs> the cut to the church is great. The church is a fantastic set. Great set. Yeah. Do you know, did they find it or build it? I'm not completely certain. I think that it was constructed. It was certainly sure. deconstructed by I mean, they the just fire. set fire to the damn thing. Yeah. I know that Windricksville is not a real place. Jam Mountain is not no. a real place. These were filmed uh, near Skiatook Lake, northwest of Tulsa. Okay, cool. So we're pretty close to the city still when we shoot this stuff. Yeah. This podcast is running very long, <laughs> and I'm tempted to open a door to a room that does not contain an answer. Uh -huh. I'm tempted just to open it because I'm fascinated by it. The symbolism of the church, the symbolism of mm. this hallowed ground that has fallen into disrepair, the use of religion, or in fact, the conspicuous avoidance of religion in a story that is based in Oklahoma, yeah, is striking. Yeah. Is there anything to the symbolism of the church? Is there anything to the fact that it is decrepit? Is there anything to the fact that it is burned down, not in an act of violence, but in an act of salvation? It feels to me so texturally rich. Yeah, I see yet, what you mean. I'm having real trouble pinning it down. I do see what you mean, and 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 just really quick to to go back to the book, just very briefly. Pony Boy does mention that he and Johnny used to go to church even after his parents yep. died, but then they took all the boys with them one day, and everybody just 
embarrass them. And so, so the pup couldn't back. sit still. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and it's handled so casually. And and he says something about how like they were trying to get something out of the sermon, but, and I, I think really all it has to say is about like Bible Belt Midwestern church is that it's just where everybody goes on a Sunday. Like it's just part of the ritual and routine of most families, most polite society Mm -hmm. and even impolite society in a lot of ways. Uh, So I think that the church is just representing a safe space, which is interesting because I do not find the church to be a safe space. No, sure, sure. But (laughs) But that that, would be my guess. In that case, though, it's dilapidation and ultimate destruction becomes all the more thematically significant. Because the fact that it has been abandoned, except not completely abandoned, overtaken by animals, overtaken by inhuman things. It's not unlike the death of Ponyboy's parents, I would say. How so? Just just that something that is supposed to provide comfort and safety ultimately doesn't or can't. But it does. This is this is the complexity of, of, of the church for me, is that it does provide comfort and safety. I mean, a little bit. They don't have heat and it's, you know, they're sleeping on a cold concrete floor. But I hear what you mean. It does. Yeah. It does for a few days provide them shelter. It does. It's also the scene, the, the, the setting for the largest emotional swing that the story takes, yeah. which is, of course, the nothing gold can stay. The evocation of that poem, the witnessing of the sunset, yeah. Johnny's kind of coming to understand something larger and more significant than himself. This is the point when Johnny turns. He is wounded in the fire, and that is a more striking turning point, perhaps. Mm. But this is the moment, it seems to me, where Johnny changes his path, where he is no longer, he's not going to be thrilled by the outcome of the rumble as of this point, not as of being injured and going into hospital. Right. And I do agree with you. But I think for me, I never associated the poem with the church, but with the nature. Like they are outside looking out at the sunrise and the church is behind them. But in that case, the dilapidation of the church and its return to a state of nature is again... Oh, I stand I in see. this church, and everywhere I look, I'm seeing thematic resonance and thematic interest, mm. and I can't unpick it all. I can't get to yeah. a single unified. And this returns us to the the notion of Essie Hinton as a present author, right? Mm-hmm. Do we attribute this complexity, the, the elusive quality of this thematic representation, to her youth or to her sophistication as a writer? Yeah. Or do we try to do neither? Yeah, well, and to her environment, as I said, to just to just growing up mm-hmm. in Oklahoma means that churches are are literally part of the landscape. Like whether they're full or empty, they're everywhere. Sure. Well, let's turn our attention from one bit of textual close reading to the most important bit of textual close reading. Let's talk a little bit about Robert Frost, shall we? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty fair to say that we both have a huge fondness for Frost. Absolutely, we do. Yeah. Arguably, I, I think maybe I'm a little warmer. Of, okay. To me, he's the great American poet. To you, it's Walt Whitman. I would argue Whitman. Yes. Yeah. And I think that Frost would argue Whitman. Which, <laughs> and I think that's completely defensible is the thing. I think that the yeah. fact that he would argue Whitman is one of the reasons that it's secretly him. But yeah, yeah, I you know, understand. We I have understand. neither the time yeah. nor the space now to talk mm. about the entire corpus of American <laughs> I poetry. I would do a Robert century. Frost podcast with you wow. or an American poetry <laughs> podcast with you for that matter. I think that the interpretation of this poem is the largest unanswered question hmm. about the moral landscape of the outsiders. Hmm. It is presented to us in a certain light. Johnny takes it in a certain light. Ponyboy reinterprets that affirmation. Uh But I'm not sure what exactly we are supposed to take from the poem. I am not sure exactly whether or not the boys are right. Yeah. So please illuminate this for me. Uh, You have 20 Uh seconds. Go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, firstly, I would say that Ponyboy starts out by saying that the reason that the poem sticks out to him is because he doesn't quite get it. He doesn't quite know what the poet means. And Johnny is presented as being someone who has never before really thought about a poem. So because of that, we get a really charming, young and innocent take on the poem. A naive they, take. A naive take, yeah. Um, and naive takes are dangerous with Frost because Frost is so frequently ironic and is so frequently sure. misunderstood. Yes. Good fences, you guys, do not make good neighbors. That's <laughs> not what he's saying. It doesn't matter which road you take in a yellow wood. That's not the point of the poem. So it's tempting to yeah. look at this poem too and to question, 
let's, uh, in fact, I was going to read it from my notes. I don't need to read it from my notes. I know you have it memorized. <laughs> I got to recite Tolkien in the last episode. Would you like to recite some Frost right now? Sure, sure. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day. Nothing gold can stay. Bravo. Is that it? Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. I still, it's one of those that like, had I memorized it later in my life, it wouldn't be so rhythmic and to the point, but that's how I memorized it. So it's how I kind of have to say it. So I would say that was a bad reading, but I did get it correct. <laughs> in a sense then, is that not a perfect reading? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a sense, a metronomic reading. So what we want to do in a first pass through this poem is just try to pick out that intent, right? It's mm. it's this idea of the transitory quality of of goldenness, the transitory quality goodness, of beauty yeah. and goodness mm -hmm. and greenness, which Johnny interprets in the book very astutely to mean youth right. and, and, and yeah, youngness, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the broader sense. So it's easy to look at this poem at first glance. Nothing gold can stay. All of this will pass. But right. we're talking about we grow up sometime. leaves and we're talking about there's a cyclical element to it, right? Mm -hmm. People who interpret this poem, not superficially, but, but on like the first layer down, will find a hope in the cyclicality of all of these things. That there will be another sunset, another sunrise, oh. another flower, another leaf. Except that Frost makes it's that not impossible hopeful. Yeah. because he talks about Eden. Eden, yes. And Eden is not cyclical, you guys. No. We fell and that's it. Yeah, sank to grief. Yeah. For me, what really stands out is then leaf subsides to leaf. That we're talking about the flower. Each leaf is a flower, but only for an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, which suggests, if not says outright, that the flower is in its way always a leaf. That the flower is the temporary mm. aspect of the leaf. And it is, in fact, a becoming that we are witnessing rather than a decline, a diminution. Which hmm. isn't incompatible with the read of Eden, I think, you know, uh, Eden sank to grief. Well, yeah, grief is the real world, but, but that is what is true and that is what endures. It's a difficult poem to unpick and it's a difficult poem to kind of reflect in the minds of these young boys. We can step away from it just a little bit yeah. to appreciate that moment when Ponyboy realizes that Johnny is getting it in a way that he himself is not getting right. it. That Johnny's naivete, that his innocence is giving him, if not a true insight, then something that feels like a true insight in that moment. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm stuck a little bit still on the close read of the poem because I'm thinking about the line, it's dawn goes down today, right? Dawn goes down today. Which is so interesting because mm -hmm. dawn rises in today, <laughs> you know, it should be, it should be. It goes down could possibly mean is, is defeated by. Yeah, right? yeah, Falls that's to, interesting. Like, Falls like today. Not in a physical yeah. sense, but in a, in a sense that's of dominance. That's lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. I was I was stuck on that, but you you had moved on to no, no, I think Johnny says. No, I, yeah. again, it is going to haunt me continually yeah, through the rest of this poem. podcast yeah. recording and probably for the next few weeks. I'm going to be thinking <laughs> about this. It's significant because we have to try and parse what Johnny means by stay gold pony boy. And oh, yeah. what pony boy takes from that and what we are supposed to take from that. Sure, sure. So Johnny seems to mean... Uh, to stay a dreamer, to stay appreciating beauty and being arrested by it, to stop and watch sunsets, to keep looking uh, for the good in people, which is something that Ponyboy does so beautifully, uh, and to remain unjaded, to not get hardened how the way you? that Dallas uh, has. Okay, Go so ahead. you're seeing it as a process of hardening. I, I was going to ask how yes. you got from remaining open to beauty and also continuing to trust and and extend oneself to others. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, that it, it is about not being calcified and hardened right. by your experience of the world. To stay open. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, to beauty, to love, to uh, appreciation, and to noticing, I think. Mm. You know, to just stopping and taking time um, Which, to experience the world around you and the people in it is a beautiful sentiment, mm -hmm. is absolutely representative of Johnny's emotional arc, his character arc through the story. I don't want to harp on this too much. Yeah. I feel like I'm already beating this drum a little excessively, but that's not what the poem says. The poem is not about remaining open. The poem is about you can't. The poem, the poem is about these things will yeah. pass outside of yeah. your control. No, no, no. And it's not about passing no. from an open state into a closed state. 
And I, I think that's one of the haunting things about Stay Gold is that you can't. Right. It's That's why it's such a beautiful and haunting thing for a 16-year-old to say on his deathbed. So Johnny does not understand this. I don't think he does. Pony Boy does not seem to understand this either. Or at least it's not articulated that he understands it. Certainly not in the film. In the book, I think so. In the book, he says, I, yeah, I could have told Dally, but Dally would never would have understood. And it wouldn't have mattered in time anyway. It's it's quite bleak. Be- beautiful, but but bleak that hundreds of kids all over the world will not get a shot at a better life than the one they have. They won't get it. They are going to be defeated at some point, and they can just hold on to hope for as long as they can, and it's not long enough. But associating that shot of changing your circumstances, and you're right, thousands of you know children in adverse circumstances are not yes. going to have that opportunity. They're never going to be given that opportunity. But we're equating that opportunity and the capitalization on that opportunity with an openness to beauty? No, 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 no. I, I don't think for opportunity, but for for hope, for, for hope that their life could be better or have meaning. So this is hope in the face of hopelessness, that perhaps yes. the gold is not temporarily transitory. No. In the sense that that it will physically pass. What we are holding to is the knowledge that it will pass, but the value of it nonetheless. That we will hold to this thing that will be defeated again and again. We will hold to this thing that will fall. We will hold to the dawn, even though it will fall to the day. Yes. And we will continue to, in spite of its collapse. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Persist to stay gold. Yeah. I like that as a reading. I do too. I'm looking forward to delving into the text of this book more closely. (laughs) So in our inadvertent discussion of the very end of this story, Mm. we can probably now accelerate through the beat-by-beat movement of the plot, I guess. yeah. Dallas comes to find them at the church. We have a brief sequence where they are considering whether or not to return. Cherry, we learn, is going to testify that... Yeah, she's like spying. Bob's murder was not Johnny's fault, even though she wasn't there. And that's not really how courts work, but that's okay. But her argument is that they go out looking for a fight, saying they're going to go kick this kid's ass because of picking her up. Yeah. We return to the church only to find that it is both on fire and positively infested by (laughs) schoolchildren. On a picnic. Okay. (laughs) Johnny heroically rushes into the blaze. Ponyboy, somewhat less heroically, but more loyally, gives Mm -hmm. chase. Mm -hmm. And then Dallas very reluctantly helps out at the end without endangering himself at all. Mm -hmm. They rescue the children. We are taken then to the hospital where we learn that they are heroes. We learn that somehow the newspaper has already been printed. Somehow Soda Pop and Derry are already there at the hospital by the time Yeah, the clock goes so fast in the film. It really does rush. Uh... This is all terrific stuff, I think. Yeah. I think this is all really lovely yeah. and and smart and fast. and The reunion of the brothers is especially, I think, really moving so and lovely. So touching. Yeah. And we move right on through to the rumble, right? Not quite. We have the waking up the next day. We have the reintegration of Ponyboy into his familial domestic unit mm-hmm. and then into his extended community. We have yeah. uh, Tubit agreeing to babysit, babysit which sure. is a great little moment so between cute. the two of them. Mm-hmm. This is where we have uh, Rob Lowe getting distracted by television yes. and Tom Cruise indicating that oh, sort of so we get Rob shoes. Lowe in the thin, thin towel too. Wow. Ooh, what? That is some hot Rob Lowe. Was that formative? Not to delve too deeply into your personal life right here on the podcast, but I can only imagine that was pretty formative for is, a large number of people. Uh, sure. The thing he's is, first of real all, hot. he's real hot. Yes. I feel like I had uh, by then already kind of checked out and not liked the movie. Like already oh, I was like, why okay. is this going so fast? Why? Because again, I, this was the 90 minute version. And sure. so I was pretty frustrated by this point. And also a Patrick Swayze girl. Like Definitely. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Derry's my guy. Derry is much more your type yes. than Soda Pop for sure. Yes. 100%. <laughs> I'll choose to take that as a compliment. You should. You and should. that I'm much older than I should be. <laughs> <laughs> Pony Boy and Two Bit go to visit Johnny. Oh no, that's after we have the meeting with Randall in the car at the diner. This is where yes. we have the the first kind of rapprochement mm-hmm. between the greasers and the socias. We get mm-hmm. this great and, and what is in the film a very good scene, despite the fact that it is nothing like as good as the scene in the book. Nothing like yeah. as good, but okay. Mm-hmm. We then go visit Johnny, who has been badly burned, who is partially paralyzed, which is horrifying. horrifying. I didn't get that yeah. my first time through the movie at all. And somehow that detail eluded me, but yeah. just very terrible. He has this new perspective. He has this like Zen-like wisdom. He's he's bit, obviously yeah. hurting a great deal, but he has found something to hold on to. At least we get the incidental beat with his mother, who is just awful. awful. Yeah. The boys go to visit with Dallas. This is a weird scene. 
the cinematography here is so strange yeah. as he leans back and breaks his cigarette on the pillow and then is hiding reaches his face, backward, reaches weird back dramatically. The switchblade, with a yeah. kind of Shakespearean specificity to his action there yeah. as he's reaching for for the blade. He's promising Very vengeance yeah. against the Soches for Johnny, which Let's is do it for Johnny. This is maybe his worst. Th this is his worst. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. as earlier, I credited him when he yep. was being more naturalistic. He's so excessively heightened yeah. here. It's not good. I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> Ponyboy has misgivings about the rumble that night. He's also beginning to fall sick. Mm -hmm. We have this beautiful night scene where he and Tubit meet with Cherry. The way that Tubit talks to Cherry is maybe my favorite thing in the entire film. He's so good and and respectful but also you know somewhat playful with her it's, yeah. it's a really great sequence uh it is she says that the socials have agreed to use no weapons during the fight there's a mm -hmm. sense of honor here this is going to be a rumble that will assert dominance but hopefully no one is going to get killed everything about the scene sets up for me that someone's going to pull a knife spoilers no one pulls a knife yeah no yeah. one pulls a gun nope. which given the pressure that we have put on guns in this story so far is surprising. Yeah. The rumble kind of goes off without a hitch when we get there. Yeah. She refuses to go and see Johnny because in the end, Johnny did still kill Bob, who wasn't just any guy. He was special. Citation needed. Citation needed. But, but that's okay. what she says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From there, we get the pre-fight, the pre-rumble activity at the Curtis house. So fun and so it's cool. So fun and cool. But also, we're getting some of that dimensionality. It's a little bit harrowing, right? We start off yeah. with uh, Ponyboy wondering when his beard is going to come in. When did mm -hmm. uh, Soda Pop start shaving? When did Derry start shaving? Mm -hmm. Like He's looking toward the passing of this childhood state. He's yeah. lo looking toward the loss of his innocence. And of course, he's equating that with the fight. We get Steve and Soda Pop arm wrestling. It's very vivid, very energetic. There is a darkness, though. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And we should also absolutely note tom cruise's physicality when we go out onto the street and for the second time in this film he backflips off the hood of a car you guys it's pretty cool this is very much action star tom yeah. cruise that we're gonna yeah. get in Turns a few out. years time yeah i was reading something too the other day where rob Lowe was talking about them working on set for this and how he was so into the stunts so yeah it makes sense so we move into the fight this cinematography is gorgeous we get the, yeah. the fire and the rain and the rain and the, yeah mm. some of the choreography is a little stagey it's a little yeah, you know little. you want to start snapping just as you get into it a little There's bit also but... because that terrible needle drop again in oh. the the this the what theatrical version is fine yes but the version that we have for the complete novel the music is fucking bonkers y'all <laughs> it doesn't make any sense the greasers win. They drive off the Soches. Dallas then takes Ponyboy to the hospital. We get this weird, heightened driving quickly. We can kind of compress Dallas a little bit here in order to talk meaningfully about his resolution in the film. The superficial reading tells us that he is broken by the death of Johnny, that ultimately it is Johnny's death that sends him off into this downward spiral and then yes. whatever happens, however we are supposed to interpret the events at the end of the film in which he is shot by the police. Mm -hmm. But he is clearly already fractured. He comes charging in at the start of the rumble, having escaped the hospital, I guess. Mm -hmm. He then takes Ponyboy at the end of the rumble without checking to see if everyone else is okay, no, really, or yeah. even to savor the victory a little bit with the community right. that is the underlying point of the rumble in the first place. Mm -hmm. They rush back to the hospital. We get this weird scene with the motorcycle cop who pulls them over. Sure, yeah. And, and then gives them an, you know, escort, yeah. an escort all the way to the hospital. What are we supposed to take from what happens to Dally? I, I think that he really thought that being at the Rumble, seeing the socials get driven off, and being able to go and tell Johnny that they did it, that they really looked to the socials for good, I think that some part of Dallas thinks that things are going to change then. And then when Johnny dies right in front of him, I think that cements for him that nothing is really going to change. So you accept the the textual read that what he says is true, that that it is the death of Johnny that that breaks Dally. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I do. I, I think there's an interesting interpretation that might be put together, that might be that might be composed from his arrival at the Rumble. And then the weird scene in the hospital preceding that, that that odd half turn away, taking the blade, oh, sure. Shakespeare, yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. the taking of the blade is so strange when he then doesn't employ it in the fight. 
this I loose think it's implied here? that he takes the blade to break out of the hospital. Interesting. Okay. That's that's my take on it anyway. I'll pick up on that the next time I watch this <laughs> film, which I'm certain that I will in pretty short order. <laughs> So Dallas leaves the hospital. He threatens a passerby with an empty gun in what is a harrowing scene. I don't harrowing. like that scene yeah, no. one bit. Really upsetting. We run back to the Curtis house with Pony Boy, who gathers everyone together, tells them what has happened to Dallas. We go out in search of him. And but that Johnny is, has died. Yeah. And that Johnny has died, too, mm-hmm. of course. We cut away to see Dally robbing the convenience store yep. with a very gun-happy owner. Yeah. What the hell? just starts firing right after him as he's running out. Mm-hmm. He then calls the Curtis house, too, for help. They go out and search, but it is too late. Danny has reached his inevitable end. Yeah. It's haunting. Mm -hmm. It remains somewhat thematically elusive. It's the holding of the gun. It's the wielding of the empty weapon. Mm -hmm. And it's symbolic representation in this movement. If you look online, people will attribute this to suicide by cop. Yes. That this is, yes. you know, to connect us back to, to last week's episode on TAPS, that, that he is a little in love with death. He is death seeking. Yes. And that this is his particular motive. I think that's absolutely true. It's certainly true in the book. It's laid out completely. Okay. But I'm, I'm reluctant to engage completely with that reading because sure. of the symbolism of the gun, because of the symbolism of power and of the ability to, to commit violence, honestly, the ability mm. to wield violence in pursuit of personal change or even just personal gratification. Do you, do you mean that he is trying to wield power over power, but because his gun is empty, his no, power is an illusion? Is that what I you're don't think that he's trying to wield power over power. I think that he is unable to give up the symbol of his power. Oh. I think that giving up the symbol of his sure. power, impotent though it is, that would be a greater death for Dali. That would be, in some sense, for Dali, the sense of self, right? The sense yes. of his own identity, particularly hardened as he has been through prison. That, that yielding that would be a greater death than being shot. More gallant, yes. Right? Mm-hmm. To bring us back to Gone with the Wind, which somehow we have not talked about yeah, in this yeah. <laughs> two-hour-long podcast episode. <laughs> and that's basically it. We talked a lot about how this film, I, I don't want to say meanders, but but takes its time takes finding its, time. its own terminal yeah. ending. We get an unnecessary scene, I think, uh, a rapprochement between Derry and, and uh, Ponyboy, mediated by soda pop kind yeah, of that's sweet we get the courtroom stuff which we do. is wild yeah. yeah also feels very canted angle and very rushed and just patched worked together i think which of course it was what's yeah, most it, important though is that they just ain't gonna fight no more they ain't gonna fight no more. <laughs> it's true it's very sweet it is very sweet no it's, <laughs> it's very sweet there is a great yeah. sense of emotional justice this is partly, I think, why I am being so nitpicky about some of this thematic stuff, is yeah. that I find it so emotionally satisfying and I don't completely intellectually apprehend it. I don't mm. completely understand how it is doing all the things that it is doing. Yeah. And I don't know how many of those things are intentional. And this is like the purpose of literary analysis. This right. is the purpose of close reading. This is why we do what we do is to to meet the text on its own terms and mm. to thereby yield greater meaning and greater enjoyment from that text it's it's challenging yeah. in this circumstance. It really is. And of course, it's challenging because this is a book that has been mediated through the vision very faithfully, almost too faithfully, right. mediated through the vision of another filmmaker, mediated through the aestheticism of the 1960s, through yes. these, these very grandiose, almost golden age of Hollywood Technicolor movies. We're, we're layering a lot onto this cortex and I'm trying to peer through those layers to find out what's underneath it all. Yeah. But I can't deny that it works. I can't deny that it's emotionally very, very impactful, yeah. particularly as we come full circle back to Ponyboy opening his composition book yeah. and starting his story, The Outsiders. How do you leave this film? Accepting that the film is not for you as powerful or as immediate or as satisfying mm-hmm. as the book, how do you feel as these closing credits are running? I, I suppose I feel that it's a classic. Like it, it just reads as a classic. I think it was shot that way uh, very specifically. And the story still works. I think you're right. Like uh, it, it fails for me as an adaptation, but it's a compelling film nonetheless. It's hard for me to look at it objectively, if mm-hmm. I'm honest. I will return to it. I'm quite sure. <laughs> no one has ever said I'm quite sure with so little certainty in their voice. It's true. <laughs> I will return to it, question mark. Yeah. It's it's I mean it's hard to say. I mean, you don't need to. You have had the experience of the film. You mm. love the novel. I don't think that there's necessarily a specific value. This I think is 
the greatest yeah. failure of the film, and it's not a particularly great failure, is just that it's inessential. I don't think that the film yep. gives you anything that the book doesn't give you. Yeah, I think you're completely right about that. Which, yeah. as adaptations go, is not like a cardinal sin. It's not no. the worst thing that an adaptation can do is, is just kind of be an accompaniment to the core text. Yeah. Certainly, you know, there are plenty of adaptations that, that fail at that hurdle. Yeah. But I think that's where we are. Unfortunately, the core text is so good that the movie is still pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to argue with. I think that's fair. At least of the complete novel version. I do think that the theatrical cut is not good. I absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. The theatrical cut should be lost. <laughs> yes. And we'll just <laughs> and have the complete be. novel. Yeah. Understanding our criticisms of the complete novel. Understanding yes. that I do genuinely prefer the very throwback soundtrack from the theatrical cut. Yes. Me over too. The, the, me too. the jukebox melange that we get yeah. in, the, in the complete novel. But we make our sacrifices where we make our sacrifices. <laughs> let's talk a little bit. Uh, let's, let's do the formal thing, I guess. Okay, yeah. Where does this go on the list of every Tom Cruise movie ever? I've been dreading this. I think that Taps is a better film. However, I think that The Outsiders belongs in front of it. I think so, too. You agree? I yeah. don't really think that Taps has an earnest intent. Mm -hmm. And Taps is a lot of technical excellence. Yeah. And not a lot of magic. Right. And here in The Outsiders, we just have a bucket load of magic. Yeah. We've got some genuinely great performances. We've got some wonderful set pieces. We've got great cinematography. Inconsistently great, but mm -hmm. great cinematography. It, it is unforgettable. Yeah. It is a classic. an event, a classic, absolutely, yeah. in the way that Taps just isn't. Just I have a, nothing but respect for Taps. Agreed. But yeah, The Outsiders is a standout. Oh, good. I'm glad that we landed at exactly the same spot there. It took us a while to get here. It did. A long episode <laughs> yes, of The Last Star sorry. in Hollywood. Hey, good news. Next week's going to be real fast, you guys. Oh, Next yeah. week, we can avoid it no longer. You <laughs> chose to jump the timeline, and now we are reaping what you have sowed. Ah, oh, worth. Next week's 1983 Curtis Hansen sex comedy, Losing It. As I said last time, a likely candidate for the worst film in Tom Cruise's I'm entire filmography. Sure. will probably be deeply problematic as well. I'm fully expecting it yes. to be stay tuned to our social media platforms of choice uh, because we'll probably warn you whether or not you need to watch it yeah. as of right now i have not seen it as of right yeah, now i'm kind of hoping either. for a few days before i have to but we'll see how that <laughs> works out thank you guys so much for listening mm. if you have stuck with us all the way to the end of the show then you know what go tell somebody about it go yeah. tell somebody about the outsiders go tell somebody about the last star in hollywood if you would like to take part if you would like to express support for a read-along, some yes. kind of textual analysis of Essie Hinton's original novel, get in touch. You can find all of our contact information over at laststarpod.com, where you will also find a link to the Patreon. Yes, Patreon.com slash laststarpod. Mm -hmm. If you would like to head over and pledge your support, you'll be able to make us talk about Dirty Dancing next month, apparently. Please. It's being sprung on me right now, <laughs> but it could happen. Patreon.com slash laststarpod. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Is stay gold just another way of saying don't let the muggles get you down? <laughs>